Good afternoon everybody and welcome to a very exciting start because, well, we've got, as you can see, a little glimpse of our Duke of Juma, Tingana. And the thing about it, which is exciting, is that he's here with Tandi and the Cub. So that means that it's the first time that we know of that Tingana has come to the Cub and Tandi seems to be fairly relaxed about it. She's moving around in this area and so is the Cub. And so it's really good news because it means Tingana now knows there's something to protect and hopefully is gonna come back and try and kind of come here and get sort of some sort of protection for Tandi. The bad news is, is that it's south of our boundary on Little Gauri, but I'm excited anyway because, well, who can't be excited at the fact that you've got one, two, and three leopards all together at once. It's really very, very cool. I have also, in my excitement, completely forgotten to do any of the things that I'm supposed to do. So, my name is Tristan, and on camera today I've got VM the Wildebeest, and I think VM will be just as happy as I am because, well, anytime we see Tingana, VM is a happy lad. VM actually loves Tingana, and, well, Tandi and Cub together is always great so that's a little bit of what's going on and then also remember that this is live and interactive so hashtag safari live on twitter and the youtube chat if you want to ask any questions or if you are ex as excited as i am about having these three together then let us know how you feel about that in fact may we might as well get this off with a bang let's do a one word tweet as to how this all kind of well how this makes you feel the fact that daddy has come and has come to see what mom is up to with the little one and whether or not they are nice and safe and so that maybe means why tundi moved all the way down here was because tingana was around and just to seek out some sort of protection from the old boy and he's looking good tingana looks as good as it is and he's kind of lying down in the drainage now tundi and and, Tum and the little one so i was about to say tumba but i've tumba is long gone since he was kind of part of Tandi's picture, but Tandi and the, there's the little cub, there's the little cub here in the background there. It's going away from us. Just through that little gap, I just saw some movement there. You can see the little bum wiggling through. So there goes Cubby. So that's two of the three, and there's Mom as well. So Mom and Cub, they're slowly moving sort of southwest away from Tingana, but they've spent the whole day by the looks of things with him. And so it's really good to see that Tingana has paid some sort of attention. And like I say, it's vitally important. Is he gotten up and gone, Viam? looks like it looks like he's up and moving so we're going to just reverse back a little bit maybe we'll get a better view of what's going on it's really tough to be in this position because we've got tamburtis everywhere we've got a drainage line and it's like i say all off of our boundary and so it's really tough to see what's going on the only problem with this is that it's i surmise that Tandi and, and the little one are going to push further south under Tingana's protection, which is not ideal. But hopefully they do come back outside. What I'm hoping is they're going to go west and then cut north back towards Twin Dams where they'll all kind of frolic together. Wouldn't it be nice to have all three of them out in the open and have them together? But let's try and reposition a little bit and see if we can see anything. Kristen, you're wondering if I could see if Tingana had a meal yet. So he is still there, Viam. I can still see him now. But let's reverse back and see if we can get anything for Tandi and the cub while we kind of here and I can still see him. But Kristen, um, it doesn't look like he's had a massive meal, but he's also not looking skinny. So he looks as though he's somewhat okay. I don't know if he's, you know, he's obviously not in prime shape at the moment because otherwise he'd be moving around a lot more than he currently is. But he's definitely seems as though he's not too skinny we can see his kind of hip areas and his hip areas look okay unfortunately though i don't think we're going to get a view of tandy in the cub because it is really just so dense you can see what we're dealing with at the moment and that's kind of where she is she's behind that area somewhere there so it's it's just a wall of trees between us and where she is at the moment but that's okay we'll eventually get it right and we'll hopefully get some sort of view of them coming back out a little bit later uh, now all of this is quite frustrating because this morning we tracked her for a long long time and obviously got into a situation where we didn't find her for the TV show. We found her about five minutes after TV finished. Senzo with Noel actually spotted the little cub on the mound and then we came and Tandi came out on top as well. So it was nice to kind of see them all together so right let's just see we'll sit here with tingana for the meantime it's very difficult to see him there's really only just a view of his spots in amongst the grass there we go you can see a few of the spots behind the fallen over tree and so while we sit and be patient with tingana and see what happens let's send you across to noel so she can tell you about how she found this little cub this morning and well what her plans are for the afternoon 
We have a chameleon at high speed. He's trying to make his getaway. He's going as quickly as he possibly can in the, in the middle of the road. And I know how much all of you enjoy a fast moving chameleon. Shame men. So as many of you will know that watch the show on a regular basis, we find them in the middle roads like this sometimes. And it's funny as they move very slowly across until they get just to the grass and then they move a little bit more quickly. Right now he's nervous. He's pretending he's a leaf blowing in the wind and he's all dark because we he was in the middle of the road and I had to stop and then reverse. I can just imagine his his eyes, because remember his eyes with a flat neck, flat neck chameleon, the eyes move independently of each other. So this big looming, very loud thing coming towards him and then screeching to a halt and reversing. So I bet he's not in the best of moods anymore. Here he goes, he's reaching the other side. So I like sports. But one of the sports that I've been trying to get used to in the, you know, 12, 13 years I've been on the continent is cricket. And I, I still can't get used to it. Now, action cricket is very quick moving. The longer cricket reminds me of this chameleon crossing the street. So, sorry for all you cricket lovers out there. That's how I feel. I'm Noelle. Hi, everybody. And we have Seb on camera. Hello, Yay! Noelle. Seb and I don't get to drive with each other enough, so we're having a good time. So this morning, Tristan spent two hours looking for Tundi and about sort of 20 minutes before we ended show this morning, I mean, they were fresh, fresh, fresh tracks, as you all would know. And, and he was on them, he was on them, and Herbie and Scott and everybody was on them. And Senzo and I were busy over going to the eastern side of Chitwa because everything that we were looking for had disappeared. And then we wrapped the show and... And Senzo and I turned around and we started driving and as we got to where you just were with Tristan now, Senzo, who's a joker, is like, there's leopards here. And I turned around and I was like, Senzo, stop joking because he jokes a lot. I'm like, don't put that on us. He's like, no, I'm being serious now. And I turned and as I turned, there's the little cub looking at us like, hello, we've been here all morning. And they hadn't been there all morning because we passed by that spot about three times. And then you could see Tanya there. She literally came out just as we wrapped. And then I was there and then Tristan came out from where he was and then James was there. And we were all just looking at her like, oh, really Tandy, could you not have been on camera? All right, so that was our story from this morning. Our chameleon's gone. We're gonna carry on. Hopefully the Inkahumas pop up, but let's head on over to James who's on Bushwalk. I know you all enjoy him. I am currently trying to extract myself from a tree in an incompetent manner, but if, in fact, since if you come around here, we have got the baboons. They are still in this tree. My name is James Hendry. Hello, good evening, good day, good morning, whatever it is, wherever you happen to be in the world. Here we find ourselves on quarantine clearings watching baboons that have been pilfering things from camps all day long. Senzo is on camera today and well I'd like to hear from you please it would be marvellous using the hashtag Safari Live please don't fall off here James that would be very embarrassing. Oh there we go and we're on the trail of an elephant that just went down this way so come with us and we shall do our level best to find him I think he's headed towards the water before we go there though there are some marvellous wildebeest over there. OK, we're not going to look at the wildebeest. We're going to go back up to the Masai Mara, to Stivovo, who has managed to find himself a herd of large elephants, I believe. Thanks very much, James, sneaking up on baboons. I hope they don't see you. Very, very good eyesight they have. And you have come 1,600 miles to the north into the Kenya, into the Masai Mara, and welcome. My name is Steve Falkenbridge, out on drive with uh, Archie on the camera, and we are out having a fantastic afternoon already. The conditions are cool and overcast, and we have found ourselves a small herd of elephant, and we've been spending a few minutes observing them, and with these fields and fields and fields of beautiful red oat grass, what I'm observing with especially the adult females is they're actually feeding on the forbs or the wild flowers. They're selectively picking them up in between the grasses, and yes, the grass has got a lot of nutrient value, but those forbs are only around for a short period of time, and they've got a lot of nitrogen and probably lots of nutrients as well that that female has learnt to feed on. And the little baby is right behind mum and is learning the tricks of the trade. There's a very little, little youngster there. And that is not the individual she was following before. She was with a much bigger female to the left, but I'm sure they are related. There's only a few in this breeding herd, and I'm sure they're all very closely related. And she is the biggest of the, of the lot. 
and it's difficult to see with the camera but I've been observing her for some time and she's selectively picking the wild flowers which is awesome thanks coastside it's nice to be back out as well nice to be out in the field and and enjoying the wind and just the loveliness of what the Mara has to behold and what better than to start the afternoon with a small and peaceful group of elephants that are at the moment blocking the road but there is no rush we are going to be meandering in towards the marsh area uh, see what animals we might be able to find there it is a good area for buffalo elephant uh, who knows you might find the the marsh pride and uh, and obviously wonderful afternoon for birding always wonderful you can see the escarpment at the back there what a beautiful place this is it's just marvelous to be out I hope everyone else is doing well out there and well done to Tristan for finally finding Tundi and Tingana the old man has come back to defend his progeny great to see Gary uh, asks, what's the average temperature in the Mara? It doesn't get below 50 degrees Fahrenheit. <coughs> Excuse me. And the last week or so, it's been on average about 60. Um, I'm not talking about highs and lows. So average, 62, 63, I'd say that's about what we've been seeing. Fahrenheit and work that out, minus 30 in Harvard. So it's about 15 degrees Celsius is the average. So it's been really nice out here. Really nice and very, very cool. We're going to just creep up on these alleys a little bit, see if we can get some more. Oh, that little youngster is playing. I don't think they're too stressed. The elephants in the Mara are quite relaxed to the vehicles, but we will no doubt give them space. That female is showing a little bit of sign there. Manu, you are keen for birding. Well, welcome. I'm always keen to do some birding. It is wonderful out here. I think I'm on 87 species now. Uh, it's not good enough yet, but we'll get there. We'll get there. Look at this old cow here. Uh, Manu, she's missing her tail. Isn't that tragic? Shame, old girl. Now, she's either missing her tail from an incident with lions at a young age or potentially from excessive amounts of ticks at a young age that potentially might have broken the tail off. But it's hard to say. But I always find it quite strange to see an elephant without its tail. It's just that funny little stub. But shame, she is still gorgeous. She is still beautiful. And there you can see she's got her head in that little bush of forbs. And she is feeding on, on grasses and forbs. It is a really good time of year for these ellies to, to bulk up. Good time for them to have their babies. Uh, the two, uh, at least two of these females are lactating quite heavily and looking after their babies Paul you ask an interesting question would an elephant feel pain when it gets the nicks in the ear and I'm sure it would quite similar to you getting your ear pierced um, I think an ear is quite a, it's a very sensitive piece of material and uh, if if Archie can go right up on, a, on the ear there, where you see when she opens it, that's all blood capillaries right up to the, the back of the ear. So I think it's quite a sensitive area. From a nervous system point of view, it's hard to say, but there's definitely lots of blood vessels going in, and there must be some form of, of nervous system to be controlling that. So I would say there must be some pain, but they are such big, tough animals. I don't think it's too much. Same as us piercing ourselves. It's only a moment or two. And so folks, we have got from our lovely elephants here in the Mara, I believe James has successfully managed to sneak up on one of his down in the Kruger. Well, we have sort of snuck up on ours. At this time of the year, it's really very easy because they just go from marula tree to marula tree. And that's, that's what this chap's doing. He's a bull on his own. I think he's probably about 25 to 30 or so. I'm beginning to think that I underestimate the age of these elephants because I don't ever seem to be able to find one older than 25 and either they uh, are universally young and they move off out of the Sabi sands and they get older or I'm misinterpreting their ages. He doesn't look very old though, I've seen much much bigger elephant bulls than him but he does look to be almost of a size that could give us a bit of trouble if he wanted to. 
come this way. Now, Patrick, while we move towards him, you say, do male elephants help raise offspring? No, they don't. In fact, there isn't a male mammal here in this environment that helps raise offspring at all. It is the sole responsibility of the females, and the, so that'll be sisters and aunts. It's not just the mother. And that's the same as just about every mammal that we have here. He's moving. Let me just go to the side of you, Senzel, so that I can get a view of him before you can. There he is behind the bush. Now, the wind is good for us, but we don't have a huge amount of cover. So we're just going to be careful here. All right, we'll see if we can stay with him for a bit longer. While we do that, let's go back across to Tristan, who has managed to catch up with the famous mother. Well, indeed we have, and it looks like Tandi is coming right towards where Tingana is. So Tingana's down at the bottom, and Tandi walked straight in that direction with the cub. So there's, T I think that's Tandi's face. No, that's Tingana. Is that Tingana or Tandi? That's Tandi. Okay, so we've got Tandi there. It's difficult to keep up with everybody. or Everyone's all over the place. Tingana to the right. So this is the first time that we've seen Daddy Tingana with his little one. Now the little one is there as well. It's just the grass is very, very long. I'm pretty sure we're going to see a flying cub at some point jumping on mom's head as we know how that little cub does. But how cool is this? This is just so, so insanely good. I'm I can't be more thrilled to have seen this because we know that there's been so much danger involved for poor Tandi and the cub with this Hukumuri male around and so for Tandi to come back into, well, to be able to get into this area and for Tingana to be around to protect his little one is priceless, priceless, priceless and super happy. I know it's not on our side but it doesn't matter. For me it's still really cool to see and it's really a little bit of a relief to have kind of Tandi with him and she seems very relaxed. You see she's walking up to Tingana. She doesn't seem to be too worried. The cub is also in that section as well. And so it's a situation where, well, hopefully, she accepts Tingana. Tingana accepts that this cub is his. And, well, everybody's just one happy family at the moment, which is amazing. Because, well, to see it... There's the little one. I told you it would come flying out at some point. We know how this little one is. It's always full of games. And they keep going kind of south and north, south and north, south and north. So I'm hoping that Tandy's going to come back onto our side at some point and bring this little cub with her. I wonder if she just didn't go here because she sensed Tingana was here. And she just came to introduce the little one to Tingana, make sure that he knows, well, this is your little offspring and you need to be a better father and you need to start patrolling Juma again to protect your little one. So that's what I'm hoping is the case. Now I'm going to go forward a little bit again because it's really difficult as you can see for us to get a view I'm just kind of like going back and forth in one place to try and kind of keep some semblance of a view on both of them but that is for me as good as it can possibly get to have the, all of them together in one sighting now Lads, you're wondering how Tingana knows it's his baby. Well, he would have mated with Tandi, so through a scent he would know that Tandi is a female that he's mated with, and then, you know, he then expects to see an offspring from her. He also has mated with her countless times, and so he knows he's a female in his territory, and therefore hopefully is an individual that he is kind of produced with, and, and, and that's why he's accepting of that cub. They have a very sensitive... Um, smell and and organ that analyzes chemical scent so her urine her scent itself will be able to be transported into that organ of jacobson that sits in the roof of his mouth and it will analyze that chemical scent and he will remember this is a female i mated with and so this cub is mine and that's why the females do drift and go outside of their territorial range to be able to then try and get um, to mate with different males so that if any of those males on the edges come back to this area it's a situation where they're able to there or takes over this area this is a situation where they are fooled into thinking that cub is theirs even if it isn't and we also know with leopards that sometimes if they have more than one cub there can be multiple parents or multiple males involved in that litter so it's a bit of an interesting one tingana doesn't seem to be too sort of concerned about what's going on he just kind of sits there he didn't even pop up his head when Tandi came along he just kind of lay there and was super chilled about life which is interesting I would have thought that he would have put up his head when Tandi approached and just to kind of see what's going on but at this stage he I think is just in full nap mode I really really do want to see Tingana walking I want to see him coming out and walking and coming towards this area can you see can you see them do you want me to move 
So VM says he can see Tanya and Cub behind the quarry bush, so I'm going to go backwards. Let's just see how far VM. A bit more. No, do you want me to try forwards maybe? I can try forwards. Uh, there's going to be a ditch by the time I get this right. So I'm just going to try and see if maybe forward gets us something because we're going to try and get a couple more views of Tanya and the Cub. And so while we do that, let's send you back across to James with that Ellie bull. Now what we've done is we've moved from the southeast up towards the north a little bit. And he's coming towards a little grove of marulas not too far from where we are. In fact, there's a tree right next to us that seems to have shed a few fruits quite close by. Now, a young bull like this, I say young, he's not that young, like I say, probably 20, 25 years old, probably 25 years old or so. It's interesting because I'm pretty sure he's seen us. We're standing on a termite mound, which means we are exposed. Elephants' eyes, I think, are better than most people give them credit for. I think they're like a semi-myopic human being's eyes. And the wind is still very good to us. Now, what's interesting about this stuff is that often, if they can see you, they don't react. But as soon as they smell, then they react to the human scent. So let's see what he does. We're pretty safe up here on the termite mound, so we're just going to stand and let him approach and see what happens. As he goes behind that termite mound, Nina, you want to know about whether or not elephants forget. Well, one hears stories of elephants being orphaned and then saved and spending time around people and certainly they don't seem to forget people then. Yeah, now he's definitely seen us. And Nina, the best example I have of their remembering, that's interesting isn't it, how he's moved the stick so he can get at the fresh grass growing in the shade, is from a chap who used to work with elephants at a camp where they used to ride them. Now they don't do that anymore. But those elephants, he went away from the camp for a long time and then came back and the elephants were still there. And he said they remembered him completely. They gr rumbled at him all the time and they seemed to recognize him from the sound of his voice even. So I, I think they probably do have better memories than some. I was always, you know, while we watch him eat there, I, I don't know how good it, other animals' memories are, but I used to have a horse when I was a young, younger man, in fact, a, more a boy than a man. And when I sold him, I, you know, I, when I left school, I sold him and I went off to university and came back again just to say hello to him. And he nearly took my head off. Um, <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm fairly sure that he didn't recognize me at all. So that was very sad, but I think elephants don't leave you with a sense of sadness like that. I do think they know who we are, and I think they remember various bits and pieces of their experiences with human beings. All right, that's a really interesting discussion that we can carry on a little bit later. We're going to head across to Stivovo now. He seems to have some feathered friends and uh, with very small brains. Welcome back. Thanks for coming back to us. I thought you almost forgot. <laughs> I'm only joking. James talking about elephants and horses. What a story. Folks, we have a bird here. And I initially thought it was a northern white uh, helmet, white crested shrike. But on further in inspection, it looks to me to be a grey-backed fiscal, which for me is a lifer. Very, very cool to see. It's a very long tail. And you see how it's got those sort of white tail edges, which then end in the black tail edges with a long black band in the middle and a, obviously a grey back and a grey head. Whereas the white, the northern white crown shrike has got a very white head and a very short tail. So that's marvellous to see for those birders out there. Another one of the Lanius families, another one of the shrikes, which would obviously, all the butcher birds or the, the shrike family all use their, their ability to, to peg and impale insects here is going back onto some form. is down on the bottom of the fork there, Arch. There we go. They often use acacias and thorns and bobbed wire to, to impale their prey on the branches. And there's many reasons for doing so. One of the major reasons is the territory 
and advertising to the females what a good provider he can be and also in times of plenty they like to store their food just like we do we've got our own larder or our storage rooms where we keep food and the third reason being a carnivorous bird it hasn't evolved to have the feet that you see most of our raptors have so it's very hard for them to rip prey apart by holding it so they need to impale it on something quite sharp and quite strong and then use their beak to rip it apart so that helps with prey that's obviously much bigger than themselves and most shrikes are quite aggressive and do take prey far bigger than they can swallow in one go and they don't have the ability to carry knives around and chop their food up like we do so that was marvelous nice little bird afternoon we're going to continue on uh, if that's a new bird for any of you out there it's definitely a, definitely a new bird for me so add that to your list. Philip. Philip wants to know if this is a safari bird and it is definitely a bird we see on safari so I'm not sure. I have not been playing the game of bingo. Uh, maybe, but it is definitely a bird on safari. Nix, I don't know if you can help me with that. I'm not sure what birds they're supposed to be linking to for safari birds. But um, we are going to be going back south to the Druma Private Game Reserve to see what I think Tristan has managed to come up with. No, it's not Tristan, it's us again. This elephant is now very close. He's only about 20 meters from us, call that 60 feet. He has not reacted to us at all. There's no ways he doesn't know we're here. We've just stood very still and he's come up to eat the marula fruits here. Now he's looking at you and saying, who are you watching me eating these fruits? Is this not too special? There is no experience in the world that comes close to sitting this close to an animal like this. I imagine if you're in the States, then getting this close perhaps to a bear might be something uh, similar. Except that a bear, of course, is almost universally unpleasant to human beings. Whereas an elephant is not. He is now just saying, listen, guys, I want this marula fruit over here, and you're sort of in my way. I don't really want to get that close to you because I find you a little bit more offensive than you find me. Now he's just giving us a little bit of uphill, just because we're a bit close. But we're now in the position where we really need to just stand our ground and stay here. Just be quiet, there's lots of food for him to eat. It's not like we're stopping him having enough to eat. Now what's interesting is that he still can't smell us. I don't believe he can smell us. but he still wants these fruits, you see. No, he's found another tree. There's another tree just behind him. <laughs> now, a lot of you are asking if he's scared. Well, he's, he certainly doesn't want to engage with us beyond a certain point. So he got to within, say, 20 meters or so, 60 feet odd, and in fact, less than that, I'm gonna say 10 meters. I'm gonna say about 30 to 40 feet or so. And he reacted in a manner that said, listen, I want the fruit that's here, but I don't want to get that close to you. So, yes, in that, from that, in that respect, he is scared. Then he lifted his head, and that showed irritation, probably born slightly of fear. And then he stuck his tail out and he moved off. And because, of course, an elephant has got limited facial musculature and limited expressions that it can make with its ears and with its tail, we interpret that as, yes, there's an element of fear in it, but there's also an element of irritation. So they'll do that in the herd if they're chasing each other. They'll do that if they're being chased by another big elephant. So I wouldn't say terrified. I would think there's an element of fear in it. Yes, absolutely. But because we didn't go towards him, we didn't shout at him, we didn't wave our hands or lift anything, we just stood here and he watched us from ages away, and ages away, from a huge distance away, and then he came up and came closer. I don't feel bad about that. You know, he saw that we were here, 
we're going to back off now and he can come back and have these marulas if he would like them. But it is just a profound, profound experience to be that close to an animal that weighs close to five tons. Do you wondering if I've ever been chased by an elephant on foot? I have. I'm not sure how seriously, though. You know, often it's been in camps when there's a, a camp, an elephant will come into camp and try and feed off the vegetation in the gardens and that sort of thing, and then you have to chase them out. And sometimes they'll turn and, and come at you. And because in a camp, normally there are lots of places to hide you know you can get behind a tree or into a room or whatever it is you're never really sure if the elephant is going to push through on his attack or not and I mean in vehicles absolutely I've definitely been chased with a thoroughly full charge but I'm pretty careful on foot um, with animals like this and I mean the thing that I'm most afraid of is becoming complacent and obviously it's always a danger that we have to guard against but as long as you're not complacent we've interpreted his age we've interpreted what he's doing we've interpreted that he's not in must and so you know I wasn't worried about being chased I don't think I would have done that with a bull 10 years older than that and I certainly wouldn't have done it with a cow who had a young calf and that will hopefully allow me not to be chased for the rest of my days okay let's go back across to Noel while I sit down and appreciate the wonder of that sighting I've got no idea what she's got I have a little dab chick also known as a little grebe so it's a dab chick or a little grebe it's a male and he's busy foraging and hunting here in the water he actually got out on the bank for a little while I have never seen a little grebe out of the water before they're usually in the water and diving underneath so this is super exciting and he's going really hectically at the the water insects that are floating around on the top of the water there we also have our resident hippo bull that is here at Bifflesook Dam, but he's not very excited with us being here. He keeps popping his head up around about, yeah, around about there, a little bit to the left, and then giving us a huge snort and then diving under the water. Hippos can stay underwater for about 10 minutes at a time. That little dab chick that we saw, the little grebe, um, can stay underwater for several minutes, but not quite as long. We also have some Egyptian geese that are meandering around, misnamed. They're actually ducks. True geese have spurs on their wings. These ones do not. And then we had a gray, oh, the gray heron's gone away. Ah, oh, here's our hippo friend, Seb. Quickly, before he gets mad at us again, and goes underwater. Thank you, Seb. Brilliant camera work, there he is, giving us the evil stink eye, like he's a buffalo. You're not a buffalo, my friend, you're a hippo. Yeah, I don't think he liked that very much. <laughs> All right, so I think this is pretty much what we're going to be doing this afternoon is birding and seeing what else is around. Tristan, as you know, is busy with those leopards, and James is getting amazing visuals on foot, views on foot of elephants, which is one of my favorite mammals to see on foot. One of my least favorite mammal mammals to get on foot is a hippo. When it's in the water, it's fine. When a hippo is out of the water and you're on foot and it is upset with you being on foot and upset at the fact that he's not in the water. It is an extremely unpredictable situation and it's not one of my favorites. I've got a very dear friend who works in the Slu, which is in Tanzania. It's the largest wilderness area in sub-Saharan Africa. And the hippos there were hunted for a really long time. So they have an, an opposite reaction to our hippos here. Our hippos here get upset and they try to run towards the water. Those hippos there get upset and they run out of the water. And he does a lot of walking up there. So he's had some interesting scenarios and he's actually filmed some of them for me with his camera, his phone camera because that type of reaction is not something that we get all the time and so I've been busy putting that into my memory banks for walking that I do. All right, well Bifflesick Dam has been nice. It's got, given us a little bit of this and a little bit of that, but I think we're going to carry on, maybe look for some Ellie's of our own. I want to see if maybe we can find that partial albino calf that we see from time to time and then just see what else is around. I'm also hopeful the wild dogs come back because we haven't seen them in a while. So we're going to do that. I might hit a little bit of funny signal at the end of the dam. <laughs> Dale, good, good question. You want to know how hippos 
don't turn into prunes when they spend so much time in the water like we do. And it's true, we get prunes, but our skin doesn't release moisture the way the hippo skin does. The hippo skin, the outer skin layer, the epidermis is extremely thin and it uh, releases the most moisture of any mammal um, that we see here. And so I think that is why they don't turn into a prune because they're meant to be in the water. We're not really meant to be in the water for that long. Every time I think of being too long in the world and how that James has something for us, so while we're searching around, we're following Z, which is on over to him. We have got the most special little sighting now after the elephants. I know I said that was the most special. This is also special. This is two brown headed parrots, and they've got a nest, I think, in this tree just below where they're both sitting. Now, not all birds can perch like that one is, sort of upside down sideways on the edge of a trunk. And they can do that because of their zygodactyl feet. They've got two front facing and two backward facing feet. And that allows them to <laughs> move at that rather awkward angle. There, they're going into the nest. How magnificent. Gee, that's really quite unusual to see everyone. We do not find brown-headed parrots nests every day. In fact, we don't even find them every month. Why don't we try and go around this way and just see if we can't see the entrance. I saw another hole in the tree that I thought was the entrance, but it isn't. Let's just walk nonchalantly along like this and pretend that we're not trying to watch them go into their nest. Because what they'll do then, if they think that we are onto them, they'll fly away and then come back later when they see that we have absconded. Still see the one perched precariously. Our elephant has moved off towards Galago Pan. Jonathan, you say this is your favorite parrot. I think he's great too. I love his colours, subtle as they are. There's the nest. You see it there? There it is. There, you can see the bird. It's just above the bird. Look at the ones coming out now. And if you look closely at them, like Jonathan and I clearly have many times, that green is gorgeous. It is the most perfect spring green color. The sort of green that cheers you up. Why it's not called the green-backed parrot is anyone's guess. Yes. Sorry, Senzo. Um, Mac, you say, is it near the Juma Live Cam, near the the dam cam, yeah it is. It's 180 degrees behind it though, so I'm not sure you will actually be able to turn the camera around to have a look at it. In fact, there's another nest here as well. Senzo, come to where I'm standing and you'll get an even better, okay, well if you've got a good view there, then that's fine. But there's an even better one from where I'm standing here. And there's also, I think a hornbill's nest somewhere close by. These knobthorn trees clearly, oh, you know what, they're not knobthorns, that's why. They've got the black monkey thorns, and they've clearly got some kind of disease in the heartwood that is eating away and making holes inside for these hole nesting birds. I apologize for any wind noise. I am facing directly into a fairly stiff southeasterly breeze. Okay, so those ones have gone. Let's go a little bit closer now and see if we can find this hornbill's nest. Okay, while we look for these birds, the hornbills, I forgot what they were called for a second, let's go down south to the boundary of Little Gowrie and Juma with Tristan Dix and the Duke. Well, we are on the boundary, and 
I was just saying to VM, it just goes to show how difficult it is to see a leopard because if you drove past here, you would have absolutely no idea that there is a leopard sitting there. And even now, where we zoomed tight in like that, those spots are barely visible. So it's pretty incredible just to see how well they camouflage. And so Tingan is still having a really good nap. Tandi and Cub are also taking it very easy at the moment. Apparently, they're further west of us, and the visual on them is also not very good at all. From our side, there's zero, but from the the southern side is also apparently not great. But anyway, while we're sitting here, I'm sure many of you have uh, seen news of another little baby leopard that is around the area. So for those of you who don't know, there is a female called the Sabui female. Now, Sabui female comes from Mala Mala. She is not one of the leopards from this area and is not Kuchava, where there's been some confusion as to whether she's Kuchava. She's not Kuchava. It's two different leopards. Kuchava is obviously from Tandi's lineage and Sabui from down south. Now, this female does have a cub and I know that it was posted on Chit Chitwa that there is a cub. The cub is not on Chitwa Chitwa itself. So I will repeat that because I've been asked a few times already by a number of people, is the cub on Chitwa Chitwa? No, it is not on Chitwa Chitwa. So there is no chance for us to be able to go and find that cub at as yet. There is a possibility that it might move up this way, but at this stage, no. The, the den is on a property called Vessels, which is straight south of Little Gari and is on the double M boundary. So on the Mala Mala boundary, there is a drainage line that comes into the Mulawati there. And that is where the cub is being denned at the moment. Apparently, she did move it slightly slightly west towards Hoffman's Vessels boundary. So it is in that area and it is quite far from where we are at the moment. The other thing I've been asked is what's happened to Kuchava that this female is here in Denning. Well, quite simply, nothing. Kuchava is also Denning, but she is Denning quite far from where that area is. She's Denning on, in an area on the Cheetah Plains and Nets boundary. There's a big Donga system that's there and she's inside there. No one yet has seen any cubs, but she does have massive suckle marks from what I believe. And I was told that it looks like two teats have been suckled on. Now, that could obviously be just one little leopard cub, but it also might mean that there might be two. So we don't know, but we'll just wait and see how that plays out. But Kuchava does have cubs. It just nobody has seen them yet. The area that she's denning is very thick, very dense and very difficult to find anything. So she's just a little bit further east, the Sabui female further west, but both of them are quite far south and that means that, you know, Tandi is moving around here. What my concern is and my worry is at the moment is where is Shadow and, and not Barbara because they have not been seen by anybody. I have not seen an update on them. I have asked around and I cannot get any information on either of them. Nobody knows where they are currently and that's why I think Tandi is also moving a little bit further south is because there's been no pressure from shadow recently and like i say that begs a question as to where is shadow what is she up to is not barbara all right is she still around have they dispersed slightly have they moved into a slightly different area onto maybe hoffman's where they're not being found a lot i don't know but it's an interesting thing and then once again the dynamics there's another spanner that's been thrown in the works of our leopard dynamics so this time it's in the female world because well we just don't know what's going on with shadow and the cub but it's all kind of upside down and so i wonder when it'll sort itself out Max, holy cow, you said, did anyone tell her that? Now, I suppose we're referring to Shadow and Cub, but... Well, <laughs> oh, follow that. Did anyone follow that? <laughs> So, yes, I know it is confusing, but essentially all you need to know is that there is a female leopard with a, with cubs, we don't know how many, that is south of Chitwa on a Nets and Cheetah Plains boundary. There's another female leopard with another cub that is on the Vessels Hoffman's boundary on Mala Mala side. So that is also south of us, and then there's Tandy and the cub here, and then on somewhere in all of this is Shadow and cubs. So there's a lot of females with a lot of little ones, and it means the boys have been very busy. What interests me is I want to know who is the father of that Sabui female's cub because that is very intriguing since she is denning on this side is Tingana made a sneaky movement down there has there been another male that's drifting on that southern boundary that we have no idea about because I find it very strange that a female would move out of her normal area northwards into a section where she's not that comfortable hasn't grown up and den with a cub if she didn't think that the male leopard was dominant in that area so it's an interesting kind of thing to see what kind of happens and what plays out right while we sit here and wait we're going to just be patient because well there's nowhere else we really want to be and so while we do that let's send you back to steve in the mara heard all of that wonderful information on the leopards of the sabi sands and you have come back up to the mara just in time for the most dangerous sport out there buffalo riding the egret is in the lead he is competing with a number of other egrets and the bets are on is he going to stay on any longer folks <laughs> it is wonderful. We had three of them in a row just now. There's one at the back.
they are riding the buffalo or as Archie said busy surfing the buffalo we have got a huge enormous herd here there must be over 200 300 buffalo in this herd and they are moving in the same direction beautiful big breeding herd of buffalo and there you can see the the front of the herd as they move they're moving away from the marsh probably away from drinking and then the rest of the herd sort of falls in behind them some dominant males in the front with some lead or high ranking high ranking females and then the rest of the herd made up of low ranking females their offspring and a multitude of different age groups of bulls now, absolutely loving the long red oat grass or red grass as we call it in South Africa and the egrets are having a field day have a look at this herd folks and you can see how they like to stick together they're all moving in one direction so this time of year it's not too much of a problem but as the vegetation gets a little bit less and the feeding disappears a bit more those individuals at the back are basically walking over trampled grazed and dung piled grass so they don't get as good a nutrition as the ones in the front and that is essentially how buffalo dynamics work marvelous all their heads are down we talk often about the purpose of herds being or groups being in a herd or in large numbers here we've got some gray headed gray herons following the in following them as well <laughs> Wendy asks if I think it tickles the buffalo when the birds surf. No, but it tickles my humor, definitely. I don't think the buffaloes even notice. There's no ill effect to the buffalo whatsoever. The egrets are just standing on them. And what they are doing is the buffalo are moving insects in the grass, very camouflage insects, and they are then feeding on them. Oh, there's really no effect to the buffalo at all. But I think the, the egrets quite enjoy the, the passage because not only are they getting insects that are disturbed by the buffalo, there's huge amounts of flies and things that are attracted to the buffalo themselves and to the buffalo dung. But what's interesting when you look at this herd, I mean, look how many of the heads are down. So many heads are down, very unobservant. Because you're in a big herd, you don't need to be as alert as when you're on your own. As we often see with these lone topi, or these lone impala rams down in, in Sabi Sands. So when your head is down, you're feeding. You've got a lot of time to feed. And when you've got 250 friends around you, it pays to hang out in the middle. And then you obviously have more time to get your condition up. And this time of year is time of plenty. Before the wildebeest droves come through and eat all the grass, they need to get themselves nice and fit. And it's important for the bulls as well, because the bulls are competing for mating rights with the females soon. Well, it's an ongoing affair, really. And if they lose condition, uh, they'll get ousted by a group of males that are hanging. There we go. It's a nice young male. Beautiful set of horns. They don't build up their condition. They get ousted by another group of males that are hanging outside somewhere, just getting nice and fat and strong and ready for whatever encounter. But you see how they all move in one sort of motion. And if anything did threaten them, their behavior would change very quickly. You see the youngsters, I think we saw it on the balloon last week, where the balloon slightly frightened the herd, and the herd moved to the, the ranks, the outside, the big soldiers or the big bulls moved to the outside, and the babies quickly moved inside, formed that phalanx and protective line. Very, very interesting behavior, buffalo. And we don't get to see large herds in the Sabi Sands. I've spent lots of time with them up in the northern Kruger. And they really are a marvelous sight. And to have them on foot and to experience their behavior on foot is always, always, always fun. So please send your questions through hashtags Fari Live. See if we can entertain you. Good afternoon. If we can entertain you with any, any more answers to anything we have. I know Tristan's told you everything there is about the leopards down that way, but let's see if there's anything up in this Harbi Sands, ah, sorry, up in the Maasai Mara that we can interest you in. But in the open there, there are just hundreds of elephant. Are we going to go there towards the marsh and see if we can see them? That was wonderful. All of those buffalo. Can you imagine the flies in there? There's so many flies around us as it is. Up in camp after a little bit of rain we had last night. 
the, but the flies inside there must be unbelievable. But what they leave in their wake is a whole lot of trampled grass, a whole lot of dung, lots of flies, lots of dung beetles. We have the herons, we have the egrets, all moving through, feeding on it, capitalizing. Matt wants to know if the herd keeps the youngsters in the middle. Maybe I can get another picture, another view here. Arch, I'm just going to pull off here slightly. You've got another view of the herd now. And as the herd is at rest and moving slowly, individuals are starting to sit down. They've probably had a drink and they're now moving into this sort of area where they're going to probably bed down for the evening. You can see some, some ruminating happening there. But the youngsters will sit next to their parents and the low-ranking females will always be at the back with their youngsters and the high-ranking females always towards the front with their youngsters and as the herd moves like this it's quite relaxed you can see there's absolutely no disturbance in their behavior so the youngsters are pretty much spread out throughout the herd but there's always sort of a dominance of males on the outside on the periphery but as soon as there's any sign of predators the buffalo herd will react and you'll see the entire behavior of the herd change. All the youngsters will move inside and the big, big bulls will sort of form a phalanx around the outside to protect everybody from, from the onset of danger. So we're going to continue on leaving these buffalo in the marsh. We're going to head down to the marsh itself, see if we can find ourselves some more eddies and who knows what else. But in the meantime, we're going to go all the way back down to Juma with my friend Noel, who I believe has got an elephant already. Listen, everybody, listen. Can we hear him? He was so close to the car, you could actually hear his feet on the tiny little pebbles that were on the road, smushing underneath. He's a beautiful male elephant. He's busy going into muss, or he's in muss, I should say. You can just see the dribbling of the urine behind. So I just want to bring that up for a couple of reasons. One, it's interesting, and two, a lot of people assume that musk elephants are super angry all the time. They're not actually super angry all the time. He walked almost up to us and then is detouring around us. So his mood can change, and it changes uh, differently than when he's not in must, but he's not always angry. It's just a heightened emotional state uh, with a tendency to have more testosterone going through, which has a tendency to lead to more aggression. Beautiful male. Older male. I don't know if you could see uh, before. Hopefully he comes around again. We'll see his, his uh, temples. His skin and it's sort of sinking in there. Denoting a little bit more age. Very similar to what happens to humans. He's not going to give us another shot. He's going to go to the bushes. He might come out just now. Christy, that is such a good question. You want to know if elephants see in color. And Christy, what I'm going to do is I'm going to reverse while we're talking about it. So, Christy, I had always been taught that elephants were slightly colorblind and um, that they don't see in color. However, that being said, I've talked to enough people who are convinced that elephants see in shades of blue as well. Um, but there's a lot of discrepancy around the research behind it. So I liken an elephant to a mentor of mine who was colorblind in red and green. Not colorblind with anything else, but with red and green, and tends to see in, in shades of browns. Um, and and uh, that to me is more like an elephant. Their eyesight's very comparable to humans. So different from a predator's eyesight that ha tends to do more of black and white and shades of gray and a bit of, of the sort of browns that we talked about. And I, I feel, in my experience, like Ellie's can see slightly more color than we think. But I don't think it's as good as ours. All right, I'm just going to do this, and he's going to come into a nice little open gap here. He's on a bit of a mission. He's probably smelling a breeding herd in the area, and he is in must, so he will be looking for ladies to bother. We might actually follow him for a little bit and see if he brings us to some ladies and smelling us the whole time, you see there, but not agitated. Notice how the tail is still uh, relaxed. The ears are listening, but the tail is relaxed, so he's not agitated in any way. 
something that I find very interesting, um, which we can chat about. Oh, sorry, that was a big bump, which we can chat about when we come back. But let's go over to Tristan for some leopard loving, and we'll see you just now. We're still with Tingana, and as you can see, not much has changed. He popped his head up for about two seconds just now, and then decided just to flop it back down again, not really to worry too much about it, and kind of just go to sleep again. So what I think we might do is I think we might just kind of maybe change our approach here. We might just go for a little loop around Chitwadam, just go and see if there's anything happening there, and then come back this way. There are vehicles that are with Tandy and Cub further down, and so if maybe they see anything, they might then call us if they're coming north. So that's probably a good idea because at the moment we're literally just sitting watching the sort of Tingana's coat in the grass really. There's not even much of his coat actually visible. It's very difficult to actually see anything. It's just kind of this smudge of spots. So Judy, wondering if it's unusual for male leopards to protect their cubs. Well, no, indirectly every male leopard protects his cubs by marking territory and patrolling and making sure other males don't come in. Is it unusual that male leopards spend time with cubs and the mother? A little bit more so, um, but not not unheard of. I've seen many different males spending time with their cubs. I've seen Mvula do it, I've seen Anderson do it, Tingana, um, a male down in the south called Shivonakele has done it. Um, so there's all kinds of males. Then often they bump into the females because, well, they're in the same territories and they see the cub and it's generally around food situations. Also the males, they're kind of curious as to what's going on. It's a new scent when they smell the female or if they're tracking them down and they find then the little cub there and they kind of just check in with what's going on. So seeing them together is, is, is not common, but it's not unusual. It's not behavior that I wouldn't expect from a leopard. This is behavior that we should see from leopards and, and not something that we really have to worry about too much or even be too kind of excited about. The only reason I'm excited about it is just because of all the changes that have been happening. And well, any time you see three leopards together is very, very excited. Right, excitable, should I say. Right, well, we're well, going to head off to Chitwadam. We're going to go see what's happening there. We're going to scrounge around. And while we do that, let's send you back across to James Hendry, who survived his elephant. And well, he's on to the next thing now. We did survive the elephant, and we're now on to something that we have not seen very often at all in recent times, and that is the giraffe, really. You see in there, Senzo? Come with me, I will show you. And I think I've seen this guy many times before. They're imminently recognizable from their unique patterns and the different colors that they are, and the fact that, of course, some of them are dark, sort of chocolatey colored patches, some of them are more chestnut colored patches, some of them have got rich gold fur under the patches, there he is looking at us. And some of them have got very pale white fur under their patches. And he's quite nervous of us. And I suspect that's got quite a lot to do with the wind. It is blowing quite strongly today. And that means the animals generally are going to be on slightly higher alert than they would be normally because the wind masks the sounds that they might use to protect themselves. It also, of course, means that the smells will only come from one direction, and that is the direction from whence the wind comes. Now, let's see if we can't get a slightly closer view of him. I think we'll just move to the side of him. We don't want to approach him directly head on. If we approach him directly head on, he will move away from us because he doesn't want to be close to us. But if we show him that we're not behaving like predators, that we're just moving to the side of him, we're not going to hide behind any bushes or seek cover behind trees or anything like that, he should just tolerate us at around about this distance. And his reaction to us is exactly the same as that of the elephants. He's just obviously much more likely to move away than chase us. But his reaction, or the reasons behind his reaction, absolutely exactly the same. They see us as predators. Even Senzo and I, standing at five foot eight and five foot eight and a half respectively, are seen by that animal, which stands at, I can never convert a giraffe's height into feet, call it roughly 16 feet or so. Even though he stands at 16 feet, he is still afraid of little old Senzo and little old me. We do have Rex with us as well, of course. He's much bigger than both of us. Mm -hmm. 
Isn't that lovely? This is the most beautifully coloured giraffe I think I've seen here. Rich chocolate brown patches, deep gold fur. He's a very good looking fellow. He is the, who's the latest? He's the Ryan Gosling of giraffes. Norita, you say, is it true that giraffe are related to camels or dromedaries? Uh, I don't think it is, no. You know, they are ungulates in the same way, I guess, as camels and dromedaries are ungulates. But no, they are not closely related. It comes from the name that they have. Their Latin name is Giraffa camelolepardalis, which basically means camel leopard. And they're not very closely related as far as I understand it. He's crying, you say. Senzo says he is crying. Since I'm astounded that you can see that this giraffe has suffered some form of emotional tra trauma and is now expressing it through the medium of tears. What do you think has happened to him, Senzo? This is a test, by the way. I'm not just asking you for the sake of it. You think he's lost his friends? No, I'm going to fail you on the test I've given you. Uh, he has not lost his friends. I think you'll find that... He has spiked his eye on a thorn. I think the giraffe take great risks sticking their heads into trees to take leaves or thorny trees, and I think sometimes their eyebrows don't protect them sufficiently, and I think perhaps he spiked his eye a little bit. So, no, I don't think that he's lost his friends. Brent, you say to giraffe ever chase people? Any animal out here, if you corner it, will eventually turn and chase you. I have yet to be chased by a giraffe, and so I don't... Th I mean, in a natural situation, they will just simply move away. But like I say, any animal that you corner sufficiently and that thinks you really want to kill it will turn and come at you. And that goes for anything from the size of a steenbok, which is this big, up to the size of an elephant, of course. All righty, we can discuss that a little bit later. Let's go back up to Stevovo now. He is not with his birds anymore. I believe he is with a number of elephants. Welcome back from a marvelous dark giraffe to, ladies and gentlemen, an absolute spectacle here in the marsh of the Mara Triangle. We have got over a hundred elephants, I lost count, that are just feeding in the marsh area. It is very boggy and very wet underfoot where those elephants are and some of them are absolutely loving it. Some are rolling around, little family groups all over the place. There's elephant bulls, little babies, lots of mud, lots of moisture and they are just feeding to their heart's desire. The nutrients here in the clay is very, very high and this area will stay moist all year and when it dries out will still leave really, really high grazing value in these swampy, marshy areas which are generally just above the line, the tree line leading to the Mara River. Bob asks a very interesting question. Is it true that elephant skin doesn't heal if it gets cut? I don't think so. I mean, I've seen elephants with injuries, uh, injuries that were man-influenced by fences or snares or whatever it is, and after being removed, that skin definitely healed. So I don't know where, where that question comes from. I've definitely, you see scars on elephants and you see injuries that have healed. So I definitely think they do heal. Um, yeah, I'm not sure where you've heard that before. It wouldn't make sense if it didn't heal because they would probably just bleed out. And their skin is quite tough, but it's not immune to being punctured. I know there was a really big elephant bull by the name of Duke in the Kruger National Park who was a research bull. They had him collared for about 10 or 12 years or so. He was bringing in really good information. And uh, what happened is every single year around the exact same time, probably about, about February, March, it might have been April, I'm not sure, but the researchers had it on, ta on cue. Every year for about seven, eight years, he would suddenly come from the north and he would turn south and go all the way down south. And then one year that didn't happen and they realized something was wrong. And we're talking about condition in buffaloes and elephants. And if animals aren't in high condition, they won't reproduce. 
And what they did is they went out and they found Duke and they found him up in the north trying to, to feed. And he had an injury. He had a really big splinter in his foot. A really, really big piece of wood stuck in his foot. And so because he was a research bull, they darted him, took him down, took the injury out or the wood out of his foot, um, added whatever, some antiseptic to it, and then let him go. And following year, normal as before. He did what he did. So they do definitely heal. Um, but I'm sure it leaves a scar as it would on our skin. But this is just wonderful to see these Ellies. You don't get to see these sort of things in the Kruger with these huge open spaces. And it's also we don't get places that are as wet as this. Um, in in the north of the Kruger in Makaleki, you do get some really nice open areas, but by no means this sort of biomass. The biomass to support these elephants all spread out. It's just phenomenal to see up here. You see a whole group of bulls there just feeding. Non-stop process of grass to mouth. Why not? If you've got an abundance of it, make hay while the sun shines. You've got such a beautiful visual of this. The Nicole, indeed, this is elephant heaven. I saw this from quite a few miles away and we had to come and put ourselves in the middle of it. And didn't want to, there's a road that actually goes through and past those alleys, but it is a very interesting road, which after doing it the other day, I'm not willing to do it again just yet. I'll wait for it to dry up a bit more first, because that is a Marshmallow King road for sure. And Archie laughed at me when I decided not to go down it, but we are still in the marsh, on a little bit more of a two-track that isn't marshy. And it is wonderful to see all these, what is he doing? There's his elephant got his head down. Oh, there we go. Looks like a female with a couple youngsters, I think. No, his head is down in the mud. That is very interesting. What is he doing? He is <laughs> getting mud on the tusks. Maybe he doesn't like the color of his white ivory. He's trying to spice it up a bit. But it looks like he was actually, now he's feeling on the ground. What often will elephants will do is they might damage some soil with their tusks and then use their trunk to pick it up and eat it if he feels he might be losing any nutrients or minerals in the in the vegetation but he doesn't seem to be doing that now Safari Wildman asks, is it, is it weird to see this many Ellies in the marsh? The last time we came through, we saw a, a similar sort of size. Um, not, not over a hundred though, but uh, I think maybe the, the marsh has dried up a bit. We had a bit of rain last night, not a huge amount, but, oh, hello. Did you hear that? They are shouting. They're just loving it. I think if every single day, if there's moisture and green here, you're going to get lots of elephant. It's my first time coming through and spending some time looking at them. The last time Archie and I went around there, we had a look at the Ellie's from a distance and we were on our way there to see them. But we saw a hyena running and then there was lion and then we got distracted as what happens in the Mara. I think you can get easily distracted. In Juma, you see animals from a close distance. You spend time with them. You have no idea what's going on around you. But this, I don't think is unusual but uh, you yeah, know they're just making the most of these fantastic conditions and we are going to continue on folks and see what else it is we might see in this beautiful area 120 elephants for me normally would be the end of my day I would just spend the rest of my day here but we are going to continue on and see what other wonders we can show you isn't that amazing it makes, makes my heart very warm to see so many elephants and to see them so relaxed as well. Really, really enjoy Elise. My second favorite animal, the first one being the honey badger, second one being elephant, and you can spend so much time with them. You can see the behavior. Archie and I were out the other night and we spent some time with that small breeding herd busy wallowing. And that was quite something to see. I've never seen elephants so many accumulated in a, a wallow about the size of this vehicle. And they were having so much fun doing what they were doing, chasing hyenas. <laughs> Excuse my cough. I have been running up in the Mara, up in the, on the airstrip, and it definitely is a different lung capacity 
up here when you're running in Juma. I think we're about 280 meters above sea level. Oh, there is a beautiful bird at 11 o'clock. Arch. I know Jamie Patterson has talks about these guys at absolute length. But why drive past such a spectacle? Always. What I love about the wilderness is there are always birds. Not even just the wilderness. You can spend time in a city. If you keep your eyes peeled, you'll see some birds. Isn't that a glorious bird? Grey-crowned crane. I've seen them a few times since being here, and generally you see them in their pairs. So I wonder if its girlfriend or boyfriend is anywhere nearby. But, oh, what's he doing? Definitely doing something. Maybe something is flying in this direction. I can't quite see. There's definitely some form of display going on there. No? I suppose when you're on your own, you got to spend more time looking up at whatever it is that might want to eat you. And it definitely looks like it would be a tasty bird if you eat birds. And if you're on your own, it's important to, as we were talking about the buffalo, they can spend a lot of time with their heads down because there's over 200 of them. This crane, when it's feeding as a pair, obviously a little bit safer with more eyes and ears. Just walking around and just plucking the grass, the seeds off of the grass there. The times I've seen them, they're always in very, very wet, moggy areas. But now he's walking through, not very wet over here. It probably would be drivable, but we don't drive in this marsh area. HT Japanese, this is called a, a grey crowned crane. Grey crowned, as in like a king or queen would wear on their head, and a crane. C R A N E. Really, really marvelous bird to see, and it's just going to go behind the bushes there. And we have seen a few of them breeding, but this one is not breeding that we know of. It's on its own, but I uh, have seen quite a few of them in this area. Nice one, Arch. We're going to continue on. The wonders out here are marvelous. So Tristan seems like he's moving around quite a lot and after his wonderful sightings of Tingana and, the, and Tandi and her cub this afternoon, he is now in James' position at Chitra Dam. I am indeed uh, Steve Ovo and it is, well, an elephant fiesta today because it seems as though James has had elephants, Noel's had elephants, Steve has had 120 elephants. I want to know from Steve if it was exactly 120 or if there was 121 or maybe 119. I just want to clarify with him because that sounds like an amount of elephants and I always love when he gives updates because they never generally are very detailed. So I'm hoping that if it's 120 on the dot, well, then that's going to be fantastic. Anyway, we've got our elephant at Chitwa Dam because we just kind of came down here to have a little look around. And this has got to be one of the strangest elephants that I've watched in a while. Now, you might think there's nothing odd about this elephant. It's busy sitting, drinking water, and looks as though it's completely relaxed. Well, no, this elephant has got some sort of attitude problem today. It keeps running around, chasing everything. Oh, there go the impalas. They're busy chasing each other, too, talking about chasing. So these guys are all running around after one another, chasing each other. The elephant chased them just now. It then chased some Egyptian geese. It then chased us. It went back to the Egyptian geese and has just really had a thoroughly good time about causing havoc. It also doesn't seem to want to get anywhere near us. If I drive one sort of meter forward, then the elephant kind of walks around and goes further. And so that's why it's drinking so far away from where we are at the moment. So I would have thought it would have drank a little bit closer but it seems as though, nope, it's not having anything to do with us. And I wonder if it's because there's a, there is a herd that is around. I can't see them now, but there was a whole herd kind of following this male down. And I believe there was a very large bull elephant in amongst them at one point. So maybe there's a bit of competition here and he's feeling a bit sort of emasculated and just wants to kind of move away and hide his head in shame. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. See now, look, you see how he's posturing already? He's far away. I mean, he's, I would say probably we're now maybe 80 meters away and tail is erect, if you can see that, and his head is up as though he's upset about something. And it's strange because there's really nothing around him other than a water buck. And so there goes a water buck's probably going to get the wrath of this elephant next.
Mina, you know, you're wondering if elephant tusks have any medicinal properties. Well, not here in Africa. Look, their poor water buck is now being chased. You are a naughty elephant. There they go, disappearing behind the damn wall. I don't, I have no idea what's wrong with this elephant. Why everybody needs to be chased, but evidently he's a grumpy fellow and doesn't want anything to do with anybody else. But here in Africa, no, there's no real medicinal value for those tusks at all. It's more ornamental than anything else. And that's why we don't see people in the local communities really hunting elephants at all in South Africa. They, they're they not really interested in it. The only reason there is poaching of elephants in South Africa is because of a market that is fueled by, you know, Asia and, and sometimes even various parts of Europe where it's used more for carvings and, like I say, ornamental purposes, not so much medicinal like rhino horn would be. So, right, let's go forward and just see what's going on with the rest of these ellies and whether or not our ellie disappears. Oh, there come the rest. I don't even have to go anywhere. They're on their way. So there come the rest of our ellies. They're starting to come down. So while I wait for these guys to come towards the water's edge and have a little drink, let's send you back across to Noel, who's got, well, one of the most beautiful birds and most agile that we have out here. Beautiful, beautiful birds. We have European bee-eaters, also known as golden-backed bee-eaters, and they are stunning. Usually this time of day, they're flying up in the sky looking for prey, things like butterflies, daytime moss, dragonflies, damselflies. But this afternoon, we're lucky if four of them have landed on this tree so that you can see their bright colorations. And I'm going to go quiet for a bit because I can hear some of them calling, and I'm going to see if maybe we can get that sound. Oh, and of course they stop when I try and get the sound. All right, Tristan has drinking Ellie's. Let's go to him and then we'll see if we can get that audio for you when you come back. Well, our Ellie's are not drinking just yet. They are slowly but surely coming down and will be drinking imminently. There we go, there they come. And so hopefully they're going to have a little but they also seem a bit nervous, don't they? I wonder if it's maybe because there's a bit of a wind blowing this afternoon. There's quite a strong wind blowing, and Ellie's generally don't like the wind, and so that's maybe why everybody's a little bit nervous. I'm quite far away from them, and I actually don't want to move any closer. Normally, I would move a little closer, but the thing is, is that these guys seem as though they're already nervous, and if I move closer, I might spoil their afternoon drink, which I don't want to do at all. I would rather that they enjoy themselves and get all the moisture that they need before they kind of move on and carry on with their day of feeding. Well, there's some young hippos that are having a little play fight as well. Very typical of the youngsters, always quite boisterous. It seems as though everyone's a little bit boisterous this afternoon. We saw Tandy's cub was bouncing around a little bit. We've had the hippos bouncing around, impalas, elephants. Maybe there's something in the weather that is causing it. It's overcast, windy weather, so I'm not sure why. Generally, the animals get a little bit lethargic in this weather, but I suppose after a hot few weeks, a bit of cool weather is not the worst thing. Now, unfortunately, just now we had a bit of sort of problem with trying to find signal, but I did have a really cool thing that I wanted to show you, and that was, it looks like Boris and Vlad are next to one another, so they are not in actually on the bank, so it's, they are in the water together and in my experience when those two are together in water it is potentially that they are maybe trying to copulate so that will be quite interesting it's completely the wrong time of the year crocodiles generally don't nest at this time of the year or breed at this time of the year it's normally in the winter months but very strange to see the two of them right next to each other so i'm going to try and reverse backwards and see i believe our problem might be sorted so i want to just see if i can get a view of the two of them together so we're just going to go back a little bit and try and see if I can get you a view. Always got to be a bit careful when you're reversing. There's some sneaky little stumps here, as I'm sure James will attest to. I've been told reliable information has been given to me about the fact that uh, James has driven over one or two of these stumps in this area. And so, you know, got to be a little careful of them. And probably he's not going to be very happy with me for telling you all of that. But, well, that's the way it goes. So here we go. Underneath this bush over here is two different crocodiles together. So very, very seldom do you see two crocodiles that close. Now, of course, it could be a different crocodile. It might not be Vlad or Boris, and there's a new member in the Chitra Dam, but I don't think so. It looks like Vlad on the left and Boris on the right. And you can see them lying right next to one another. There's no display of mating just yet. Sometimes when you see mating displays, you'll find the crocodiles will lift a little bit and their backs will expose and then they vibrate their backs and this water kind of dances on the back and it's a show for the female to be able to kind of 
indicate that they are ready to, well, the male is big enough and strong enough to cause this to happen, and then the female will mate with him. But so far, they're just right next to one another. But like I say, very odd. I mean, we know that we've been to Chitra Dam many, many, many times, and we do not see these two lying right next to each other in water like this very often at all. So either there's a food item that is in there that they're both just kind of clutching to but I can't see anything floating in the water and certainly doesn't look like anything under the surface of the water or there's a situation that maybe just maybe they're starting to befriend one another in the start of a possible courtship process wouldn't that be quite spectacular to see I think it would be amazing to see our crocodiles mating and I wonder what's happened to our little crocs as well I always worry about them and wonder where they've gone So, Francis from Israel, you're wondering if I've seen the young crocodiles while well, we look at a beautiful woodland kingfisher that's just had a nice little bath. You can see it's all wet and so it's just going to preen itself out probably quite shortly. But no, Francis, I haven't seen the little ones for quite some time. I, I mean, I don't know where they are. You know, as they get a little bit bigger, they tend to venture a bit more and so they might be quite far from where we can see. Um, the last time I checked near the fallen over tree stump on the other side of the dam, it was kind of quite dry around the area where they used to spend time. So I don't know if they're using that as a protective area anymore or if they somehow... What is that on the back of... It's just a leaf. I thought for a second it might be a little grasshopper or something that got itself caught, but it's a little leaf. You can never be too sure after we had a chameleon in a Birmingham's boy's mane. You've always got to double check these things and see exactly what's going on. So always good to double check, but very cool to see. We'll have to monitor this closely over the next few days to maybe tell James when he comes down here tomorrow morning for the TV shows to have a little look out for our crocodiles and see if maybe they're together still in the morning. I think a little mating crocodile action would be a first for many and a certainly a turn up for the books in this particular section of South Africa because we don't have many crocodiles in this area at all. Right, now while I contemplate what my next move is going to be, given that Ellie's are starting to depart, crocodiles are just stationary, and well, the leopards haven't moved either. I'm still thinking about where is next, and so let's send you over to the man who we've just been talking about, James Henry, as we plod along and see what else we can find. Well, the man you've just been talking about is now standing in a rather stiff breeze, which wasn't blowing until very recently. What I've got here is the first time I've seen Ozeroa spherocarpa flowering, and it is the plant that smells most closely like standard-issue jasmine, which always takes me nostalgically back to my childhood. It's delicious, but on it there is a great deal of activity. We've got ants harvesting bits and pieces, but most importantly... We've got predators devouring the ants and various other flies and bees that are coming here to feed off the bounty of these flowers. And I'm going to show you some of them now. There are spiders all over this plant. Some of them microscopic, some of them a little larger. So that is an ant. That is Polly Rakus the ant. You know her very well. I've introduced you to her many times. Now what I'm going to do is just twist this around to show you our first spider. That is not a spider, that is a, pl a flower. Sorry about that. Let's leave this particular bloom and I'll take you to the most impressive one here. There's an actual kill going on in process. It's like coming around the corner and finding the Inkuhuma pride eating a zebra. There is a spider that is now wrapping up some kind of little bee. You see that? You can't see him. Now, as Senzel said to me, this is really the work for the microscope. But that little black bee that you can see there is being eaten by a spider. And then there's another spider crawling around. There, you can see it moving now. That's another spider on the same little bloom, possibly trying to get in on the action and steal the recently deceased bee. Just amazing stuff. Then I've got a much better spider down here. Well, better spider. He's a bigger spider. And he looks like a bark spider. Oh, he's moving. No. He's gone. He's a bark spider. There are crab spiders all over this thing. Here's one. Here's a little crab spider. There we are. Ah. This crab spider, I believe is being caught in flagrante delicto. 
That is my favourite expression in the world. Ooh, hang on a second. This spider is having a romantic tryst. <gasps> Look, Senzo, can you see? It's got the mail on its back. Can you see that? You see it there? How marvellous. I've never seen that before. There it is. You got it. So I think that's the male, and he's going to be lucky to get out of this alive, of course. But look how the female is beautifully disguised, like the flowers of this Ozeroa. What a very spectacular plant. You could sit here, you could do a whole three hours on this plant. You'd find endless things to entertain you. There are beetles and ants and bugs and flies and bees. And the smell is just too gorgeous. Uh, yes, sometimes they do, Anna. You say, do female spiders eat males once they finish eating? Absolutely they do. One of the spiders that we have not seen much of this year or last year, of course, was the golden orbweb spider, and that is on the account of... that is on account of the lack of rain that we've had. And the big female will almost... I think it's almost always eat the male if she can get hold of him. So often what he will do is bring her a gift, she'll start eating it, he'll do what he has to do and then try and get away before she's finished eating the gift that he's brought to her. Senzel finds this all rather amusing. <laughs> it is quite amusing, really, I think. Right, I'm going to keep looking here for interesting things. There's a little beetle or two. While you look at them, we're going to go across to the Maasai Mara, where Stivovo is looking at an antelope that we once thought was the fastest in the world, but isn't. Unbelievable, James. It's amazing, folks, what you can find in one small place if you only spend some time and look. Now, can you imagine the diversity of animals that are out there, not only the big ones, but the small ones? If you see what James has just seen in one bush, to what we're seeing here in this vast, endless landscape. We have this topi and a few topi in the background, some waterbuck in the clearing, and the, the endless amounts of insects that are in between us and them, if you think about James's one small little bush. We stopped here to have a look. There was a waterbuck having some interesting behavior, but he's since moved off. But now we've got the topi, and there's some waterbuck there in the background. Quite easy to remember, Dufasa, as you would hear in the Lion King, Mufasa. I love the way they say that. We have the Dufasa waterbuck that are loving the marsh just like the elephants are. And some buffalo in the background. The waterbuck are very bulk feeders and they're never much further than a couple of kilometers a mile or so from water. And we are not far from the Mara River. There in the background, the tall trees Lions the Mara River. Dale wants to know where ox peckers nest when they're not pecking at other animals. Well, they're nesting in cavities and trees, very similar to starlings, uh, woodpeckers, barbets. Quite often it's the barbets and the woodpeckers that create the holes, or there might be some natural cavities formed, but the ox peckers actually line their, their nest hole with the fur of animals that they take or borrow, I don't think they ask very nicely, but they accumulate it just like they do the ticks. They'll take that and put that in the cavities of trees. And there at the background you can see the multitudes of trees and then we have a piggy. So folks, the animals are looking very relaxed this afternoon. Taylor had the Olalola Pride towards Chitwa Airport this morning. They've since moved from there, not too sure where, and the Marsh Pride, this is their territory, but I don't think they're anywhere to be seen. Because these animals this afternoon are extremely, extremely chilled and relaxed. I think, I think they've been watching Safari Live as well, and they know where the lions are. Even the warthog are quite relaxed, and they seem to form the major diet of this marsh pride. Isn't he a beauty? Is it a he? I think it is a she. Yes, that is a young she. 
moving through the long grass. Quite often animals will, will spook a bit when they see a warthog because just the body posturing and the size of them often looks like that of a leopard or lion stalking through the grass. So it's not uncommon to see animals stare at them momentarily. You see it quite often with giraffe. Yeah, he's coming to join some friends, feeding. They also thoroughly enjoy this very green marshy area. Beautiful grazing. They're all enjoying it before the holiday makers come in a few months, making the most of it. Good time of year for all the breeding to happen. You are a beautiful pig, are you not? Robert wants to know yeah Robert wants to know if there's a limit to the amount of tourists coming in and out and while I answer that look at that vista is there a limit to how many tour vehicles can come in and out well they're all permitted everybody has to pay to come in and a lot of them are on on actual safari tours and those tours would be operators they'd be regulated but when it comes to how many private vehicles can come in I wouldn't know my own experience so the Kruger Park doesn't have a limit as long as you've paid the permit and you obey the certain guidelines and rules then everything is fine uh, but there's definitely times that you're allowed to be in the park gate opening times and we're going to be heading back after gate opening so we brought a ranger with us this evening who's looking after us if need be and uh, so definitely they do legislate or regulate that but there is making money every single person coming to the park is paying a fee and a levy and that goes to conservation so I think it's a good thing as long as you can manage that and make sure people aren't misbehaving and getting out the car and driving when they shouldn't drive that is where it becomes tricky but the regulation of people coming in and out I think I don't think there should be a limit uh, obviously if you get 10 million in cars there'll be a problem but I don't think that's going to happen most of the people come here with registered tourism operators or stay at lodges well folks that is just look at that I just wanted one more view of that before we move on towards the forest we heard what sounded like a Ross's Turaco coming from the forest there I'd love to see one I heard one the other day so I'm gonna make our way towards the forest line see if we can be lucky and uh, oh, who knows I think we might be sorry Arch thank you very much beautiful vistas this is definitely one of my favorite parts of this place is just those endless 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 setting settings doesn't feel like any rain but you never know Archie what do you think it's a few drops coming now I think I might have jinxed this earlier when I said it's not going to rain I know everything so we continue driving, saying hello to the Topi. We're going to go back to Noel, who I believe is also driving down in Juma. I am also driving. We're busy looking for a breeding herd of elephants. Our male elephant that we had earlier ran into the bush, bushes and chased, chased another male elephant. Um, and then they, they got stuck in that uh, block there. So we moved on. So we're just maneuvering around and checking for more birds as well. But a big wind has picked up, so a lot of our bird life, every time we stop and try and get it on camera, it blows away and flies off. So I think we're going to head back to some more water holes and see about a breeding herd of elephants or whatever happens to be along the way. All right, so the comment is, I wonder how long it would take me to be in the greater Kruger area, like where we are now, um, to be able to say we've seen it all. So I have been guiding, I'm in my 11th year this year, and I cannot say I've seen it all. I think James is pushing up to about 20 years, maybe 18 years, and he also sees new things every day, um, myself as well. So I, I don't think it's possible to say you've seen it all I think I think that nature is so amazing that there's no way you can say that you you've seen it all especially when it comes to the insect world that James was showing you um, that flower mantid that we get every now and then on screen the first time I saw a flower mantid ever 
was probably about four months ago. Scott Dyson showed it to me. Um, so I, it comes. And remember, every guide has different uh, specialties and places that they focus more on because it draws them. And so then when you meet other guides who have a different sphere that like something different, then they, you get drawn into there and you learn something new. It's absolutely incredible. I mean, I see behavior and, uh, <clears throat> and, and different aspects every single day that uh, are, are either new to me or I've only read about. And, you know, that's after a decade of guiding. So, yeah, I, don't, I don't, do not think that you, in one lifetime you could say that you've seen it all. And then you might have seen it all, in, or most of it, in one tiny little spot. But the minute that you move away from that tiny spot, it's going to start all over again. And that's one of the reasons why we love our jobs and what we do. Most of us uh, did not like school or had ADD at school or just need constant a flow of information and new things to keep us interested and guiding definitely does that so yeah no you're not you're never gonna see it all and that's the beautiful thing of life constantly learning constantly seeing constantly exploring new aspects all right so update with lions the Incahumas are in Manuleti, which is very far from here Torchwood Pride is in Biffles Hook which is Unfortunately, also not anywhere where we can head to. I found some tracks of what I think are the Styx Lions. Um, Styx Pride going north over Gowrie May, but also north, but I'm not 100% on that. They were a little bit older, and so I don't really have an update there. Our Lions have not been kind to us the past week. They've all fled the coop, as it were, but it happens. would like to know if we get caracal we do get caracal a caracal for those of you that don't know what a caracal is let me stop my roving safari and show you we don't get to see caracals often um, they are quite elusive and also tend to come out in the darker periods oh, I even had a bookmark there all right so this one on the right hand side is a caracal known as a roy cat a red cat in Afrikaans. Beautiful there. And then here as well down at the bottom you can see those tufts on the ears. In a decade of guiding with guests I've seen Caracal four times if that puts that in perspective. Then over here is another one of our smaller cats, the Serval. A Serval I've seen with guests maybe about 12 times in just over a decade. And that just has to do with uh, where, where I've been guiding. Both are amazing. Both are extremely adept predators. I think some of the best footage I've ever seen in a documentary was when Attenborough came out with his second Life Of, and they did Life of Predators. I'm pretty sure it was this one. And there's that beautiful footage of the caracal jumping up and catching the guinea fowl. It was, a it was absolutely stunning. I mean, they can jump, I believe, up to about two meters, if I can remember correctly. Ooh, Steve Ovo has one of my favorite birds. And so we're going to head on up to him to the Maasai Mara so that my friend can tell you all about them. So let's go there and you can check it out. Thanks very much, much Noel. Yes, we have got the southern ground hornbill. We've got two individuals there, an adult and a youngster. There it is. The youngster's becoming an adult. You can, if you let's see, have a look at the face, the face has got a little bit pink. The face is a little bit white before. When they are juveniles, their face, there we go, the one on the right. When they're juveniles, their face has got sort of a whitish gray color to it. And this one, it's got a slight pinkish tinge to it, which means it's probably becoming mature soon. And it's got something in its mouth. Does it? Or is that just the beak? No, that's just the beak. The most beautiful eyelashes of any bird in the southern ground hornbill. We were talking before about the importance of trees for nesting habitats for oxpeckers and the like and hornbills, southern ground hornbills, just like the smaller hornbills that we know, all rely on tree cavities for their breeding. So when we use the word habitat, habitat's not just about food resources and water, it's also where they can breed. So what we see behind them in that woodland area, very, very important for a number of bird species here to breed and proliferate. Noelle was saying that she's seen caracal, what did she say, four times. I was thinking about that. I think I've counted caracal only six times in my life, which is not a lot. They are a very shy and elusive animal. I'm sure we've passed many more than we've actually seen. But it's always exciting when you see them.
very very exciting I've seen quite a few tracks but only six times in my life which I don't think is a lot when you consider how many leopards and lions I've seen it's definitely more than ten <laughs> so it's getting to that time of evening when the ground hornbills, which spend most of their time, as the name says, on the ground feeding, are going to find their roost and starting to preen away from the nest as you would do to keep the parasites and dirty bits away from where you sleep, which makes a lot of sense. A little bit of a tickle under the armpit or on the arm there. It looks like a male. You see, it lacks that sort of blue throat patch just under the beak. It's difficult to see when it's not looking at you. But once again, I'm surprised. Again, looking at the ground hornbill, I'm seeing an individual here, or the other two times I've seen individuals, and now there's just two. So I find that quite strange. I don't know, maybe there's something going on with the dynamics of hornbills out here. In South Africa, you always see them in, in groups of three or five. That's my experience, anyway. Marvelous. Well, we are making our way down. We're going to pop our nose into the Mara River, have a little look and see if we can see a hippo or two. And uh, we're going to leave these ground hornbills on the ground and go down to Mr. James Henry, who I believe has something to eat. No, you don't want to be eating this one and stiff off, or you don't want to be dipping your nose in the river either. I was just sort of waiting to talk to you about this thing here, but then I found myself rather comfortable and thought I might just have a small snooze. <clears throat> don't worry, you don't have to watch me sleep. Okay, what this is, and we've talked about it before, ow, 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 is a poison apple, but it's a particularly poor example of a poison apple in that, well, it's rather shriveled and possibly one of the last ones of the season. And these annual plants, here's a better example of the actual plant. This is the poison apple plant over here, Solanum panduriformi. The thing about it is that I think there are, well, there are annuals definitely, and in drought years they're going to struggle, and in dry years they're going to struggle and not produce nearly as many fruits as they would have otherwise. They are closely related to the aubergine and the tomato, and the pepper, of course, and I mean the sort of, well, is there a collective term for those peppers? The green, red and yellow peppers that you get? They're part of the deadly nightshade family. I think that the peppers are part of the deadly nightshade family. Anyway, what it means is that if you are a depressive, for example, you should probably avoid eating them because depressives apparently struggle with foods made of the deadly nightshade. Isn't that interesting? This one itself is, it's called a poison apple, but as far as I'm aware, it won't kill you. And in fact, I know people who will squeeze it into milk and to sort of give the milk some flavor and curdle it slightly. So I don't think they're deathly. But apparently, if you are prone to feeling depressed and a bit sad about things around you, tomatoes, aubergines, uh, poison apples and peppers should be avoided. Take it from me. Senzel, I've just noticed your shorts which are a piece of magnificence, the likes of which haute couture in Paris is uh, sorely missing. They are green, everybody, with sort of bands at the bottom, floral bands. They are quite something. I've never seen anything quite like them. I'm sorry to have become distracted like that, but really, they are <laughs> very special. OK. <laughs> Mike, you say, is there anything in nature I would rather not see? It depends at what quarters, you know. It depends how close uh, I need to be. And I need to pick Senzel up. Apparently he's... <laughs> there we go. It was very smoothly done. Mike, uh, you look, I wouldn't like to see if I was poking around in here, for example. I wouldn't like to see a black mamba come rearing out at me. That would be very unpleasant. But I'd love to see a black mamba at a safe distance. So really it does depend on the distance that you are from a creature. Uh, but there's nothing in nature I can think of that I don't want to see. There are many, many things in nature that I'd like to see at a safe distance. 
But uh, no, nothing that I can think of that I don't really want to see. I tell you what I don't like seeing hugely. They don't entertain me much at ticks. I've tried to like them. They have a right to life the same as anything else does. But I find them offensive. I find the way they move, their sort of crawly skin, the fat grey ones once they've sucked blood, I find them fairly offensive. Nicola's saying flies, you would like never to see a fly again. Yeah, I find a tick more offensive than a fly. A mosquito, uh, which of course is a fly, is uh, probably close to the tick. But otherwise, no. Many things I would like to see. Uh, primates in the wild are a particular sort of fascination for me in my latter years, or in these years. And so I do very much want to go to the areas where you see lots of primates, especially the great apes. Tr Kristen, you're saying pepper ticks obviously not in, uh, much of a concern because I was lying on the ground. Uh, they haven't been bad this year on account of the lack of rain. But, uh, you know, they don't really bug me that much. I mean, in a very wet year, yes, you lie in bed at night and scratch yourself to pieces. But... Ah, they don't last very long, and once you're used to the uh, parasites that they carry and inject into you, you don't really feel much from them, so I don't worry about them too much. Now, I'm just examining here the ants on Acacia, no, not Acacia anymore, sorry, on Vachilia gerardii, the red thorn. And you will always find ants on the Vachilia trees, or these thorn trees, because they often have little glands that secrete a sweet nectar that the ants are able to feed on. And the nectar is normally in the gap. Oh, these are fantastic ants. It's normally in the sort of node between the leaf and the stem. These are cocktailed ants. Can you see them, Senzo? Come, bring the camera here. He's now... <laughs> standing with it like it's some kind of shoulder exercising device. Can you see it's cocked its tail? A cocked tailed ant? And you won't believe what else I found once you've seen the cocked tailed ant. Have you seen it, Senzo? You didn't see it? Right, what we have here is a minute grasshopper. Senzo, you're going to have to come to the side. You'll never see it from that side. See. You can see it. All right, apparently we're not going to wait and see this little chap. We're going to go across to Noel, who is going to begin us on our school drive. Welcome, Friendship, Westlake and Lanesville schools. We hope that you all are going to enjoy, enjoy your show with us. On screen right now, we have the sneaky little hiding water buck. It is a type of antelope species. You might, in some of the places where you're living, have deer. Deer and antelope were related at one point, but they've obviously moved away from each other. There's also some impala that are in the background there. I am Noel, and on camera I have Seb. Hello, Sebastian. Hello, everyone. He's saying hello. So we have many different species of mammal out here and many different species of animal. Something that we see often are antelope species like the water buck and then the impala that were just behind them. What I want to do is I just want to come around the corner just so that we can possibly see them a little bit better. It's very windy today, and when it's very windy, it takes away an antelope species ability to hear and to smell properly and they get very nervous when that happens because they don't trust their eyesight like we do. They use their hearing and their smell often. We also have some cheeky, sneaky baboons that are going to be just here as well. So let's see if we can get everybody in frame. Ooh, sorry, sorry. And of course they saw the vehicle there. You just see the bums running away. Let me just try one more spot for you. Now these baboons are part of the Gowrie gang. My very good friend Graham, when he worked at Juma, which is the lodge that's just here, he spent a lot of time with this Gowrie gang to the point where they sort of accepted him as one of their own. And he can actually still do a lot of the vocalizations with the baboons that, there we go, that mean many different things. Now I don't speak baboon. He is a very good mimic and he is very good at uh, being able to uh, use the tones that he learned 
uh, for whatever scenario happened to come into play. So a troop of baboons, also known as an oligarchy of baboons, Gianna, that is an excellent question. You want to know how long does it take for animals to fully learn muscle memory? So mammals like this are very similar to mammals like us, where you have to repeatedly do something day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, to learn how to properly fend for yourself and, and work within your habitat. Um, for each mammal species, it's going to be different. I think for something like a baboon, it'll be a few years. For something like a little leopard cub, it's going to take a few years as well. Impala and water buck, impala is what you can see right now, maybe a little bit less time. Also probably depends on how long that animal, or that mammal I should say rather, lives for. Great question. So these are impala. Like the water buck, they also have horns. So we chatted about impala and waterbuck being somewhat similar to deer. So deer have antlers that grow once a season and then shed. Antelope species have horns that grow once in a lifetime and if they break off, that's it, they don't grow again. So this will be a male impala. Now some antelope species like buffalo and wildebeest, both males and females have horns because it helps them function within their habitat, within their niche. We actually have some wildebeest that are just here at our 11 o'clock. <laughs> Aaron, the, the Gowrie Gang, the Gowrie Gang is the name of that troop of baboons. Uh, part of the property that we're on now is known as Gowrie. And so that's where they got their name. And it's not every troop of baboons that has a specific name, it's just that troop. And they're cheeky sneaky, they try and break into our houses, they know how to open up uh, the sliding doors to get in, they steal our food, they're, they're very cheeky. So here on screen we have another antelope species known as a wildebeest or a gnu. Also in a herd. Most species that are eaten by predators, so that would be impala, waterbuck, and wildebeest, the ones that we've seen now, of course others will be eaten as well, tend to live in big herd structures to protect themselves. Ali, very good question. They use their horns, the males in any of the species we've seen so far will use their horns to fight other males, to keep them away from ladies. It's all about getting girls. It's all about getting girls and then making babies. Uh, the females with the wildebeest that have horns just like the males, there's a few reasons for that. One is it helps them defend their youngsters. The other reason has to do with because of the type of herd structure that they have, the type of movements that they have. If the males were the only ones that had her horns with the wildebeest, the testosterone levels between the males would be so high that they wouldn't be able to function properly. So basically they would just be aggressive all the time. So <clears throat> the females also have horns so that when they're moving around in places like Kenya, where Steve is, and I'm sure we'll go to Steve at some point in Kenya, where they migrate long distances, it helps keep the aggression levels down. Whereas with Impala, they don't migrate anywhere, and our wildebeest on, on Juma don't migrate, but it's, a, it's from, uh, from the background there. Impalas tend to be in sort of one general area. They need lots of water all the time. Now, my friend Steve, who's up in Kenya, which is about 1,600 miles northeast from us, has a very large mammal he would like to show you. Welcome, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, to the Maasai Mara, to the Mara Triangle, all the way up in Kenya. We are currently sitting with one elephant bull, and there are a few more about to join him from the drainage line. Let's see what happens here. A little bit of behavior happening on the left. These two elephant bulls are just crossing the drainage line there. And let's see what happens when they meet their friend on the other side. <laughs> look at how he's going up and look how he's going down. They're not able to really bend their legs as well as we are elephants. So they really do struggle to climb. <laughs> Hello Reina, you want to know why do baby elephants stay under their mother? Uh, one of the reasons is to feel safe. The other reason is she's a huge portable or mobile shade machine. So she brings shade with her wherever she goes and the babies will heat up a lot quicker than the females. 
I'm going to introduce myself for the moment, but these uh, elephants are having so much fun, I thought we should go to them first. Look at that, eh? He's a little bit, a little bit cheeky, isn't he? Well, my older brother would do something like that, you know, he'd, he'd go through the drainage first, and then when I try to come up the other side, he'll keep me from getting up. It was a game we used to play in primary school. All the boys used to try and try and get onto this little box, and it was the object was to throw the other guys off. That seems to be what these boys are doing. And so, welcome to the Masai Mara Triangle. My name is Steve Falkenbridge, and I'm joined by Archie on camera. And please send through your questions with your teacher. Uh, and we are in the Mara Triangle with a huge, huge herd of elephants. We're just going to let Archie pan across the landscape. There are I counted earlier, well I stopped counting at 120, and the elephants are absolutely loving life. So there's no sun at this time of day, so to answer your question again, babies find it quite comfortable being close to mum, and uh, elephant behavior, there's a lot of touching, lots and lots of touching, just like with us. When we're a child, a lot of, a lot of babies actually sleep more comfortably when they're touching their, their mommy or their daddy. Uh, and elephants feel the same. They feel being very close to mom, being very close to, well, not dad in the case of elephants. Dad doesn't play much of a role. But they'll stay with their parents, with their mother, their whole life if they're a girl. If they're a boy, 16 or so, they get pushed away. Wow. Emily, in the Masai Mara, you want to know how many species are living here? Sure. Uh, it just from the mammal species, there's probably about 80 but I'm just guessing that off the top of my head now. When it comes to species in total, there's insects and birds. The numbers just go on and on and on. I think there's about 10,000 just in Africa alone mammal species. So we're not going to talk about the birds as well. But there are lots and lots. There's so much going on out here. And there's a little guy. Look at that little one. You see, he's not underneath mum because there's no threat at the moment. But if anything was to threaten that youngster, immediately she would run underneath mum's tummy or in between the group of females for protection. It's marvellous being out here. We've been with these Ellies. We were on the other side of this very boggy marsh area before. And we've decided to come to the other side to show you how special these really big African elephants are. But from the plains of the Masai Mara, we're going to be going all the way down south, 1,600 miles, to my good friend, James, who I believe has got something very small to show you. We have got something very small. Hello, everybody. I hope you're enjoying your day at school. Quite nice for you to come on safari rather than do anything serious like mathematics or geography anything like that. Here we are on safari looking at termites. Now I know you've been looking at very big elephants with Steve but here we've got some termites and they're different kind of termites I think probably from the ones you're used to at home. Those ones will eat your furniture of course but these chaps here are harvester termites and here's one that I'm pointing at now just crossing our little pathway carrying a piece of grass and he's taking it to his home over here. Now these termites don't build mounds, they are called harvester termites and they just live under the ground and what's very interesting about them compared with any of the termites that we get in this part of the world is that they are black. Can you see that? And that means that they've got melanin in them when that means that they are able to cope with being in the sun. Most termites out here cannot be in the sun so they operate purely at night. They're a little bit like vampires I suppose you could say. They operate only in the night time when the sun's gone down. Here's another one dragging its <laughs> grass to the hole. And th this one gave up, the one we were first watching. Let's just watch and see if this one makes it all the way back. Very, very strong to be able to carry something so big when you're so small. See, they've stopped moving now. Why have they stopped moving? Come on. Here we go. That's it. Ah, now, Jenna, you're wondering if there are ladybirds or ladybugs in Africa. Yes, there are many different kinds of ladybugs. Some of them are what we call indigenous. In other words, they're from Africa. But some of them have been imported or brought in from other parts of the world. And that's often not a good thing. So the ones that are imported often will be pests on crops. 
Well, Isaac, you ask a very good question. Here's a termite carrying uh, a piece of what is it? It looks like a piece of grass. I would say about three times its own mass. So three times its weight at least. There are some ant species that will carry up to 20 times their mass. In fact, probably some that will carry up to 100 times their mass. So I think ants are stronger than termites. Termites are not related to ants. They're much more closely related to cockroaches than they are to ants. But I think you'll find that ants are the tougher ones. Now that's the termite nest. Over here in the middle of the road, we've got an ant's nest. And these ants seem to be harvesting not quite the same dry grass that the termites are going for. They look like they're looking for seeds. So they've gathered a whole lot of grass seeds here from a plant called Eragrosta superba, or the sawtoothed love grass. Here's what it looks like. Here is the sawtooth love grass over here. And they've gathered all the seeds and they've put them in a little pile. And I suspect what they're doing is taking the husk off. That's the kind of um, non-nutritious covering on the seed. And they're probably taking the seeds down into their little hole, which is underneath the ground there. Can you see that there? Jonah, you're wondering how fast termites run. Well... Not as fast as you can, Jonah. Um, even if you're walking, they won't be able to keep up with you. So really not very fast at all. I'd say they probably go less than half a mile an hour. Yeah, about half a mile an hour. I'd say that's probably the top speed of a termite. It's not going to be winning any 100-meter uh, races anytime soon against any of the other animals out here. Okay, let's carry on. We are hopefully going to find you something like the elephant on foot because it's really nice to be out on foot in the wild uh, we don't want to threaten ourselves at all but while we look for that let's go back to the Masai Mara where my friend Steve is sitting in the near darkness because of course they are a little bit further west east from us so they get a bit darker a bit earlier Thank you, James. Your termites, I'm sure, are amazing. It not it incredible we're able to see those little guys with such a beautiful lens? And from the little guys to the big guys, we are back with the elephants. And uh, we had a little bit of an interaction here with the female. These are young bulls here, but um, he's doing a little bit of dominance display there. Sometimes he, they like to climb up on each other to practice what will be happening later on in the years when they're a little bit older. But if you go to the left there, Arch, to that female, there the female there, she's got a very small calf, but not that small, and she's quite pregnant herself. You can see her tummy is very, very big. They have a gestation period or pregnant for about 22 months. Ella, Ella wants to know what time elephants start or what age they start growing their tusks. They start at six months or so, they start getting a little milk tusk through, but then from two years you start really seeing a little bit of a, of a bulge coming through, and then they grow throughout their life, just like our teeth, except the elephant's teeth keep growing and growing and growing. And there you see that little baby. You missed it just before, but we were in the road and we turned around and I think we were between her and those other young bulls and she got a little bit upset with us and she gave us all sorts of nasty behavior. Did I get scared, Alina? Did I get scared the first time I saw an elephant? I don't think I did. The person I saw to the, with, with was my mother and she was quite relaxed. But the first time I saw one really, really close, yes, I did get scared. And the first time on foot, definitely you're always going to get scared. But if you trust the people that you're with and they know what they're doing, these are very peaceful animals. And we, we just have to respect them in their space. And now I have lots of information about elephants and their behavior. And it's important to, yeah, feel the fear if you want to, but don't let it control you, you know. Just enjoy these elephants. They don't eat meat. They're only going to hurt you if you cause them any damage or harm. So that's important to remember. So we're going to go all the way back down south again as our elephants march into the glorious sunset in Kenya to Noel, who has got a flying, beautiful bird. 
do indeed have a really large bird of prey, a large eagle. It's a pale morph of a Marshall's eagle. So by pale morph, I mean sometimes that they're lighter in color and sometimes they're darker in color and sometimes they're a little bit tawny or rufous. This is the pale morph and they are incredible. These eagles can eat those baboons we saw, a small baboon. They can take down a small baboon as well as vervet monkeys. Now where it's standing, it actually looks like it might have something underneath its claws there. Their talons are very sharp and very good at grabbing up their prey. And usually when they perch, they perch a little bit higher up. Now he most likely will sleep in this tree or a tree close to here for the evening because they don't fly around at night. What else will he eat? He'll eat birds like Franklin's, which is sort of like a partridge. They eat snakes sometimes and lizards, smaller birds. Oop, he's gone to the toilet. Usually when birds do that, it means they're about to fly. And then there he goes, look, it's in his, it's in his foot. Did you see that there? As he flies off, he had whatever he was eating in his claws. It looked like a small bird or maybe a rodent. I'm going to see if we can find him again to see if we can see what was in there. That was very, very, very cool. Let's go on the, on the chase. It's windy. I got to hold my hat. Sorry, Nikki, say again. Ah, Brooke, you were asking what do they eat? So yeah, Brooke, um, vervet monkeys, small baboons, uh, small birds, birds like guinea fowl and, and uh, Franklins, uh, lizards that they'll eat, sometimes snakes, they eat quite a bit. Now we just have to find where this bird went and it's a Marshall's eagle is not an eagle that we see all the time. And they are so beautiful and strong. There's, <laughs> I have a friend who grew up in, in the greater Kruger National Park, just a little bit east from where we are. And he was telling me when he was a small, small kid, his mom used to yell at him when he was going where he, I can see it. It's just in front. I'm going to try. Do you see that little gap there, Seb? Do you think we can try through there? So he's at directly at 12 o'clock through those branches in that larger tree. I just don't want to drive too close right now. Oh, there we go. Yeah, because I don't want to chase him away. So I know that there's a bit of a branch in the way. Seb, what if I angle the car a little bit more to the right? We're just trying to see here. There we go. Maybe there. There, you can see him eating. Anyway, so his mom used to say, don't go wander outside at certain times um, because the martial eagles might come and grab you. It's like an old wives' tale. Not that they really grab children. <clears throat> so with the blowing branches, it's a little bit harder to see, but you can see his claws definitely stepping on top of his prey and then going down and picking up bits and pieces. I just want to go and sort of break those branches off, but I don't want to scare, I don't want to scare him away. This is really incredible, everybody. So it's not just predators like lion and leopards that make kills. We have these predatory birds as well. And martial eagles like fresh meat. Luke, good question. You want to know how can the marshal get the bigger prey? Luke, it has really strong claws. So it soars in the air. The, when the sun's out, it bakes the ground and then hot air rises off the ground in sort of a funnel shape. So they soar on those funnels so they don't have to flap too much. And then when he spies something, he dives down with his, with his talons out and grabs it. And the talons have these huge claws at the end and they basically smush the skull. There, ah, oh, that's much better. There we go. Thank you, sir. Look, it's sort of stuck in his foot there. It looks like a bird. He's picking the feathers off. It's stuck in one of his talons. Oh, you got it unstuck. I can't quite see what bird it is, but it looks like a rather large bird that he's managed to grab. See how he doesn't want the feather bits. He wants to get into the meat. And to get to the meat, he's got to pick the feathers off. 
Allie, good question. You're asking how big does this eagle get? And I'm just checking in my bird book quickly to give you a correct answer. I would say about two and a half foot, but I think I might be a little bit over 78 to 86 centimeters. What is that in inches? Yeah, about two and a half foot is, is roughly the same. And then the wingspan, so it actually might be a little bit more, 78 to 86. You guys are going to have to Google that. I'm bad with converting math. I'm sorry. And then the wingspan is uh, to about two meters to two and a half meters. So that's two yards to two and a half yards. It's a very large wingspan. So if you convert 86 centimeters into inches, I believe it's two centimeters to an inch, if I'm remembering correctly. So 200 inches, and then you'll have to do 200 divided by 12. I got, I got you to about there. I didn't study math very well in school, everybody, as you can tell, and it's, I've suffered later in life. But that's okay, I found something that I'm good at where I don't have to do math too much. Look at him, he's got all the, he, I think it looks like he's picking at the, the wings there and then getting the meat off the, the wing that's closest to the body part. So that would, like if you're gonna eat a chicken, this is the wing bone. Duncan, good question. You're asking how much does he eat in a day? So a meal like this will suffice him for, uh, suffice him for about a day, um, maybe a little bit longer. If they're eating smaller things, they might need to kill a couple of times. And because this eagle's killed its prey right now, sort of later in the evening, he'll go out hunting again probably when it warms up tomorrow morning. So maybe around 7 or 8 o'clock in the morning. Maybe even a little bit later. We're getting some really good views here, everybody. This is a very special sighting. Now the end of his beak has a hook part that helps him get all this meat and feathers off. And you can actually see with his talon, can you see the claw at the end of the talon on the left hand side there? Look at that claw. We can't really zoom in any more than, than we have now. Our cameras are brilliant, and Seb is a brilliant cameraman, but we're at about our, our reach at the moment. Look, look at the, I mean, you can, his feet, his talons and claws are huge in comparison to his body. So he's filling a very specific niche by having a foot structure like that and the ability to catch larger prey, because other birds of prey will catch a smaller prey species. Now, Mr. James Hendry is still out on bushwalk, so I think let's go over and join him and see what else he has to show us that might be something small or maybe something big. We're just trying to get you a view of an elephant on foot, but it's in some very, very thick bush, and so we can't go any closer than we are now. There are a few of them inside this thicket over here. Oh, I can just hear them moving. What we're going to try and do is we'll go a little bit further down this way and see if we can get round them. In front there, you've got Rexon, who is a tracker extraordinaire. He's also an extremely experienced guide, and he is looking after our protection because, of course, we're in an area where animals are potentially dangerous. Let's just walk this way a little bit. Alexis, you're worried about father animals eating their children and will they eat them? Well, distressingly, sometimes, yes, they do. They often kill them. They don't often eat them. And normally it's not the actual father. It's somebody else. So if we look at lions, for example, lions will kill young cubs that are not their own. But they won't eat them. They'll normally just kill them and then leave them. But it's very unusual for the father of an animal to eat its own youngsters. Yeah, it's just very thick in there. You can see, you can't see through those bushes there. And the elephants are in there and we'd get very, very close if we went, were to walk in there. 
Now, Max, you want to know if I get frightened if I get too close to big things like lions and the other big cats. Max, yeah, I do. And, you know, there will be people during your life, Max, that will tell you you never admit to being frightened. But as soon as you think you're not frightened, or as soon as you are not frightened by something like an elephant or a lion or a leopard, well, that's when you know that you're going to get into trouble because they, these animals deserve our respect. And as soon as we take chances with them, then we are really in trouble. So it's good to have just a little bit of fear. I don't think we're going to get a view, I'm afraid. I think we're going to have to leave these fellows and head and see if we can find something else for you. Yeah, while we do that, let's go back to Steve, who's got some big cows. And you are with us again up in the Masai Mara, or should I say the Mara Triangle, and we have found one of the most dangerous animals to encounter on foot. So James was trying to find an elephant on foot. Elephant on foot and buffalo on foot are very, very dangerous animals. And here we have got the Cape Buffalo. And this is a group of boys. Uh, earlier on the show, we spent time with a huge herd of buffalo, 250 or so, that had females and babies and bulls. And here we have a group of bulls that spend a bit of time together away from the females because I think that can be quite difficult spending all your time with all the females. But these guys move away from them for a little while. And uh, the reason why it looks a little bit gray is that we are looking at these buffalo in infrared. The sun has set up in the Mara and we are looking at them with something that the army or the military would use to see people at night. So we were looking at them with very, very, very cool cameras and lights here that enable us to see these buffalo. If I look at them without the monitor, it's actually just black spots in the distance. But we're able to see the shape and the outline of the buffalo. Some of them are starting to lie down. They've been feeding for hours. And now they're going to sit down at night and, and chew the cud, as they say, ruminate, and basically vomit their food into their mouth and chew it and swallow it again. Doesn't that sound wonderful? But the Cape Buffalo, one of the awesome animals people come and see in the savannas of Africa. And they are really quite, quite funny. You see all the insects around in the light. And the buffalo are throwing their heads all over the place. Because there's lots of insects. And here they come. They are coming towards us. <laughs> Isaac, what animals will get scared and run away? Um, a lot of animals, when they first see vehicles, will run away. But in a place like the, this area and the Kruger National Park, they see vehicles quite a lot. So they get quite used to it. But if I got out of the car and walked towards these buffalo, they might get scared and run away because they see me as the very early human in Africa who hunted them with spears and bows and poison and whatever it was. So they are very fearful. Of, of people but they don't see us in the car they see this big box over here so they don't really run away from us but if I drove too close they'd probably move away a bit but they don't get scared of the car if that answers your question but can you see all the insects in the in the infrared there the buffalo are not liking them there's lots of biting insects biting flies there's mosquitoes and if I just keep quiet for a moment see if you can hear the echolocation of the bats. I can hear some bubbling casino frogs in the background and some crickets. And I heard the bats before, but they have now been they've now been overshadowed by all the other nocturnal animals that are coming out and we're going to go all the way back down south to Tristan and we're going to be heading on back to our abode for dinner and we're going to be going all the way back down to Tristan, who I believe has got an update for you. 
Well, yes, hello everybody. Uh, you haven't met me yet. As Steve mentioned, my name is Tristan, and on camera I've got VM the Wildebeest, and you haven't seen me because, well, we've been trying to find you a leopard, but unfortunately our leopards decided to go in a very thick area, and well, we couldn't see them anymore. We did see three of them this afternoon, really early in the afternoon, but they went away, and unfortunately we couldn't find them again. So that's a bit disappointing, but, 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 you never know what's around the next corner, so we're in an area that hasn't really been driven very much recently and I'm trying to find a leopard up this side of the world for you guys so I just want to see there's something seems to be in a tree over there but uh, it looks like maybe just a branch to go you wondering how does a lioness or which lioness choose to leave a pride so that was what I thought I saw in the tree is just a dangling piece of bark unfortunately but lioness don't actually choose to leave a pride unless they're, the pride is too big and they can't find enough food then you'll find if there's not enough food around then the pride will split and you'll find some females will go off and other females go on their separate areas if there is enough food then the females will always stay part of the pride it's only the males that will be kicked out when dad realizes that these boys are getting too big he's going to say that's it enough of you you need to go out now and you need to go and find your own territory so it's only really the boys that get chased away sometimes what will happen is if there are quite a few boys and girls that were born in the same litter then you'll find a situation when dad chases the boys sometimes the girls will follow those young males and they'll go with them and try and see where they go and then either they form their own pride or sometimes they'll even come back to their mom and then rejoin the pride again but most of the time females will stay within the pride it just makes it much stronger and allows them to hunt lots of big animals like the buffalo that you saw with Steve if they stay together and form a nice big unit right so my thing hanging in the tree was just bark unfortunately I was hoping it was going to be something else but we'll carry on ah Rena, you're wondering if I get scared when we get close to hyenas and lions. Well, Rena, sometimes I get very scared and I actually have to just try and sit and tell myself everything will be okay. No, I'm just joking. Rena, no, I don't really. And I'll tell you why. It's because in this car that we have here, the lions and the hyenas don't see this as something that's going to hurt them. It's something that doesn't take away their food and they're not taught to hunt us by their mothers. And so most of them see us as just a kind of object that moves around and they really don't fear us in any way but they also don't think of us as something that they can eat and so they actually leave us alone and so we can have hyenas and lions quite close by and they don't worry about us at all so I don't get too scared about them when you're on foot and you're walking around like James that's a little bit different then you have to be a little bit careful with lions hyenas not so much because hyenas when they see you walking around normally they'll walk away from you they don't come and hunt you whereas lions they can be a little bit more scary and sometimes if they've got a carcass so if they've got food or if they've got cubs then they can be very very aggressive and they can sometimes then charge at you and they show their teeth and their claws and their tail whips all over the place and you've got to be very careful then not to do the wrong thing because if you run away well then you might get eaten by those lions so that makes you a little bit scared sometimes or a bit nervous but otherwise on the vehicle no Oh, Kenzie, you want to know what the most dangerous animal is that I have seen? Well, Kenzie, unfortunately, it makes me sad to say this, but the most dangerous animal I've ever seen are humans. And you might be thinking, why would I say other people are dangerous? Well, to the animals out here, humans are probably the most destructive things. We've destroyed lots of the environment. We've hunted animals. We've poached animals. We've taken animals out of their natural habitats and put them in zoos and all kinds of other things. And so, unfortunately, humans are the most dangerous of all the animals. But in terms of being out here and, and trying to drive around and walk around and try to kind of watch what's going on, probably the two most dangerous are elephant and buffalo both of those you have to be very careful of they both very very strong animals and an elephant can easily throw this car around and, and turn it over and use its tusk to try and gore and try and maim the car so you know you've got to be a bit careful with them and then buffalo they well, they just grumpy all the time so you've got to be a bit nervous of them but like I say the most sort of dangerous thing is actually humans more than anything else right 
Now I'm going to carry on on my road in the hope that I'm going to find you a spotted cat and while I do that let's send you back to Noel who's got a beautiful view of the setting sun. We do have a very beautiful view. It is sunset for us here. So where Steve is in Kenya, the sun has already set. He is just at the equator, just a bit north of the equator. We're still farther south of the equator. So we have about an hour's difference between our sunrises and sunsets, roughly, give or take a little bit of time. Now the cloud cover that's building there towards what would be mountains if we could see all that way, but unfortunately we can't see them, are rain clouds. Those are cumulonimbus clouds. And that's where you get a lot of rain from, but also it's where thunder and lightning comes from. When they build and build and build, you get quite a lot of friction inside. And that's where the sounds and that lightning comes down. Now, Tristan was talking a little bit about the environment and our effect on the environment. There are some places where they put special airplanes up in the air and then put special seed into the clouds to create rain. But when that happens, it then destroys rain in other parts of, of, of the world. It has a knock-on effect or a butterfly effect, as it were. So the whole idea behind the butterfly effect is that when a butterfly beats its wings here in South Africa, it can affect different aspects in China, let's say, for, for uh, argument's sake. Now, we need rain quite badly. It is our rainy season right now. It is our summertime, and this is when we get rain. Steve was talking about rain in Kenya. Their rainy seasons are a little bit different because of their proximity to the equator. They get big rains and little rains. We get summer rains, and then our winters are very dry. Unless you're on the western side of the country, uh, which is in Cape Town, then they get winter rains and then dry summers. And we've been going through a bit of a dry spell at the moment. It looks nice and green, but we do, we're do we short some few feet of rain. We need quite a lot more for this season. Now, I think we usually do a little moment of silence for drive. So I think everybody, let's do our moment of silence for a little while with this beautiful, beautiful sunset or what's left of it. Listen to the birds. How nice is that? The wind through the trees, the birds calling in the background. We've got our dusk chorus starting where all the birds are saying, good night, good night, this is my territory. And then we'll get dawn chorus in about 12 hours. Now, Jaden, you are asking me, what is my favorite animal? Now, Jaden, my favorite animal to see on Game Drive is an African wild dog. This is the African wild dog here. We didn't get to see any on Game Drive this afternoon. They're a highly endangered species. There's only about 3,500 of them left on the entire continent of Africa. And they only occur in Africa. It's also known as an African painted wolf. They're extremely good hunters. And they're very good parents. And they work in a system where the whole pack takes care of each other. Every coat pattern is unique to the individual and the reason why their numbers are so low has to do with humans like what Tristan was talking about. We've taken away a lot of their space and also brought in a lot of domesticated animals and a wild dog doesn't care if it eats a wildebeest like we saw earlier or if it eats a cow or a goat and so they've been persecuted uh, for many 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 years and their numbers hopefully are on the increase rather than the decrease but we'll just have to wait and see what happens. Now we don't have too much time left so if you have any more questions please send them through. Ooh, Liliana, good question. You're asking about another predator, a leopard. You would like to know how old do leopards get? A female in the wild can be about 18 years old, sometimes pushing to 20, but around 18. And males usually top off between 12 and 15 years. So the male leopard that Tristan was looking at earlier is between, between 10 and 12 years old. And the female that he was seeing earlier is about 11 years old. And the little cub he was seeing is about three months old. It's about the size of a, a mini soccer ball, a mini football. Um, and, and so they can live for quite a while, but there are other predators to worry about, lions.
lions and leopards don't like each other, cheetahs and lions and leopards don't like each other, spotted hyenas and all the predators don't like each other, same with the wild dog. So it's, it's a very tough life. Sometimes we don't get to live as long as they would like to, but fortunately Tangana and Tandi have been doing very well in their lives. All right, kids, thank you so much for this evening. Really hope that you enjoyed. We're going to have a nice little look at the rest of our sunset. Don't forget tomorrow morning or tonight for you all, 10 p.m. Eastern is our fourth installment of our live TV show on Nat Geo Wild. So please join us 10 p.m. Eastern for that. We will also be having Safari Bingo. Don't forget. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy your evening.